Did you ban? Did you receive the the link? Uh, not yet, but I'm going I to check. No worries. Yeah. yeah, I have it. Okay. I sent so, you just in case my presentation. Yeah, then I can share it. But if yeah. you connect to this link, yeah, yeah, and just make sure that you cut the yeah everything so that we don't have mm -hmm. any and. It should be fine to share your presentation. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, the, uh, so without my uh, video, okay? Yeah, yeah, without and, video. And without sound. Yeah, and without sound. And also okay. without sound of your computer. You have to switch okay. it off, otherwise there yeah. will be a... Okay. Okay. Yeah, just switch uh, it off. Yeah, yeah. Then it's perfect. You can do as you are used to. Uh, without, uh, without voice from no, without. Because you have the mic here, so we have a red Hello, I come Hello. 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 Ouais, J'ai essayé de revenir, mais je ne savais pas un peu de jeûne et euh, okay. l'organisation de. Okay. So, is it okay? Yeah, just you, you can uh, just, I can, I know how to enlarge the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah, like this, and then you just do the share. Uh, and and share. No, no, this also you switch off. Um, I don't see how I could switch it off. Just click on it. No, just click on it and then it will be switched off. Ah, because you have no. connected to um, headphones. I think it would be very difficult Is that possible yeah. that you're connected? Uh, no. yeah, yeah. Perhaps I'm not using no, it. No. Okay, but the, then leave the, it like the this. Because okay. you don't, you don't hear anything. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, for the, for the, the Because I muted my yeah, computer sound. Yeah, yeah, but that's sound, fine. Okay, okay yeah. that's fine. Yeah, that's so fine. So well, I can... Yeah. I can return here and, yeah, and then you can have do the share the here with this the, and the, uh, when, whenever it's your turn. Okay, yeah. when it's my turn. Yeah. If, uh, okay. The discussion I uh, will have to. Should we start? Yeah. Uh, okay, so while you are here, you are moderating. Okay, the, uh, exactly. You can uh, yeah. take it over. Because it's. Hi, Abela, for your presentation. Um, Actually, using this computer, so I will. I have this one. Uh, yeah, use this one, and uh, then you do uh, share screen. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's yeah, already you, doing No, you cannot because I have this to stop. Bella. Yeah. I have to stop this and then, but this is your presentation is here right. on the share screen. I will come and help you. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. But we are not starting. Okay. Um, um what is here Oops. hi this is you of course uh but you can just change it no i mean it for then i have i will start a little introduction and then i sit here while i do that and, uh, yeah. and then we will start that was a clip. Yeah, that was a clip. Yeah, that was a Yeah, that uh, was a clip. Yeah, that was a clip. Yeah, that was a Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we will do that that uh, after me then uh, then I will get three persons to present. Okay. 
Bunun çalışmış tespiti Dürü Stark, Ingeberi Stark'ta. And then, then you pass it over uh, on the She's all right, yeah? She's all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that, that both together, they will have like, uh, what did you say? Huh? Okay. How many minutes? Uh, well, I think I this is yeah. worse. You yeah. can start there. So they will be longer. Well, you are there, so it's you. Oh, yeah, okay. good, but it's uh, just temporary here. Um, Okay, uh, we will uh, start this uh, day uh, dedicated to uh, analyzing the uh, an important sector of, of the uh, economy. Uh, I energy or energy incentive industry, which is uh, uh, an important uh, set of uh, industry and uh, try to uh, see what are the uh, impact in terms of job and localization. And I, I, I think it's a really important uh, topic, uh, mainly because we have sector that are very different, but also that many of them, perhaps not all, uh, will grow in the future because they will participate to the renewal of the infrastructure. So it's not sector like cement or, or steel that will shrink in a, a near future, uh, but uh, uh, will be stable or perhaps even uh, increase. So that's also a specificity of uh, this sector. But uh, before saying a few more words uh, more, I would like uh, to thank uh, the ECF uh, Climate Foundation, European Climate Foundation, uh, it's, uh, 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 they, they give the support for uh, this project and we have a, a long cooperation uh, with them. I have also to thank the European Commission that is funding the uh, Institute. So uh, what I, I think is at stake uh, is that in all the, the sector uh, we have for uh, adapting for the future, we have two main variables. We have technology, and in this domain, technology is in, uh, in particular importance, and there is different type of uh, technology that fits or, or not fits uh, for uh, different uh, sector, but we have also societal change. And I think uh, more we, uh, we are analyzing uh, the transition uh, or transformation, which I think is perhaps a better term. More, I think, uh, uh, it's perhaps I, I'm political scientist and political scientist uh, when they have already two variables is enough. But I, I think that the two main variables are technology and societal change. And you can see how we can achieve results by mainly societal change. It would be kind of here, it would be more going in the direction of circular economy or by uh, technology, uh, technological uh, change. and. Uh, it would be here hydrogen or capture uh, and storage of, uh, of carbon. Uh, the, the, the two give again different scenarios uh, and can scenario could be also seen uh, uh, in the same time, but can be also uh, progressive because that's clear uh, that technology is mature or arrive on the market at a certain time, so we can perhaps see sometimes there is most of the time there is a delay between five and 10 years when we say that should arrive, arrive on the market and that <laughs> in reality is changing, but societal change, uh, as we know, uh, we don't, it's rather complex. We cannot just say you have to change the behavior uh, and that's it. Uh, that's something take uh, time, or take, take election, take uh, to, to take the, the right direction, to have a new set of, of ID, uh, et cetera. I think also that the, um, uh, in this sector, what is particularly uh, uh, interesting, and we have uh, fascinating studies uh, about the, the CBAM and, and uh, the, 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 the exchange, is that you cannot uh, see that in isolation. In most of the sector, uh, they are part of kind of 
global competition <laughs> and in the global competition and certainly for steel uh, and we had that before uh, with China. So it's not, not something new. It's the, just, uh, I think that's important remark because we are speaking about no climate change, but some of the trends are uh, coming from before uh, and uh, be uh, on localization uh, of the steel or uh, the, the effect of, or on employment. So that's also the kind of dimension that we have to take into account and uh, that the commission and the member states are, are now taking uh, into account. So it, it gives you a kind of flavor and then I, I let uh, uh, Bella to, to uh, better explain what is in, in the project. I think about the complexity uh, when we speak about the I, uh, uh, energy intensive industry, uh, the, the complexity uh, of several sector or two parameters that I have to uh, adapt technological uh, change and societal uh, change that you have to integrate the, 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 the global trade uh, within uh, that in the same time that you have to could have some growth uh, at least in the short term uh, in some of the sector because they are important for the transition. So they are also uh, a means uh, to achieve uh, the objective of uh, reducing uh, dramatically uh, the emission uh, of CO2 and other gases. So uh, with that, I have to excuse uh, Philip because he, he was uh, not able to, to, to come. He gave you uh, your, his best regard uh, for, for the, the, the conference. Uh, and once again, uh, I would like really to, to, support, to, to give uh, um, my gratitude to the support of the TCF for the different projects that we have uh, with them. So uh, no, let's enter in, uh, I put the skeleton on the beef of the, the project and that's for better. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, good morning. Uh, um, everybody and and thanks for uh coming and uh um uh sharing us uh, sharing with us uh, uh these presentations about the the results so uh, as philip already said uh we have uh, had this this joint project with the european climate foundation on energy intensive industries uh, that are absolutely um so critical um for emission cuts. And now I just would like to go down with the slides. I don't have this pointer. Do we have this thing? Okay, good. Um, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so well, um, energy intensive industries, um, steel, cement, chemicals, plastics, plasters, fertilizers, uh, etc. Uh, are, are, are critical for emission cuts uh, and they're critical for Europe's industrial base. So uh, one thing is clear that, that uh, Europe needs a strong uh, industrial base uh, to keep uh, industrial competences in Europe, uh, not least uh, also preserving uh, 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 employment uh, workplaces. Uh, there are more than 3 million um, workers in uh, these uh, industries in Europe. So it's also in terms of employment uh, important. Uh, I will also show that, that uh, for industrial emissions, uh, the uh, well, uh, the narrower uh, segment of these energy intensive industries, so steel, uh, cement, chemicals, uh, make up um, more than 50% of industrial emissions under the ETS. Uh, but uh, when, when we include uh, all uh, 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 the other subsectors, almost 80% of uh, ETS emissions uh, are covered by these industries. So it is no question, it's absolutely critical. Yeah? That that uh, and 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 uh, what is also uh, important that often we are saying that well, unlike transport or or buildings where there was no emission uh, reduction uh, since uh, 1990, these industries already had uh, uh, decreasing their emissions uh, almost uh, by 30 percent. But if we look at uh, closer. 
these emission cuts happened due to crisis. Uh, the biggest part, one part was done between 91 and 94, due to Eastern Europe soil transformation crisis when, when, when the old industries were collapsed. And the other uh, emission cut in these industries was between 2008 and 10. And since uh, 2011, no emission cut at all. Uh, even there was some increase. So there is really something to do. Uh, and then there are um, different pathways um, uh, 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 in terms of technology and and uh, and uh, organization. And uh, as uh, as Philip already said, uh, main uh, ways are so. One is the real, genuine uh, way, uh, transformative change. That is, of course, circular economy, material circularity, uh, recycling, uh, and uh, more efficient. Uh, 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 industrial processes. Uh, uh, that is a way that is more or less uh, shrinking uh, these activities because if we do it better, uh, we use less material. Uh, that is one uh, part, uh, but then uh, we have the uh, innovation uh, way that is mostly using hydrogen. Uh, what uh, has to be said also that that uh, almost half of these industrial uh, emissions in these sectors are due uh, to the uh, energy use of, mm -hmm. of uh, heating up the processes for furnaces that that uh, that high temperatures are needed for the uh, material uh, processing so uh, if instead of fossil fuel, uh, clean electricity uh, would provide these energy inputs that already uh, would contribute to a huge uh, uh, degree of emission cuts. Uh, but this is, uh, so in a way, this is an easy way of doing things, but on the other hand, it is complicated because it needs a completely different energy um, uh, supply and this is in the making, but it takes time. It needs uh, huge investments. It needs a completely new, uh, well, uh, first of all, clean energy based on renewables and also uh, electricity grids that are matched uh, to this uh, uh, energy demand. So uh, that is kind of the backdrop of this whole thing. Uh, and, and, and once we have that, then we have uh, uh, the, the, the option to use uh, hydrogen for, for uh, uh, the uh, uh, energy supply and the ca uh, carbon capture and storage uh, for, well, uh, putting the dirt under the carpet. Uh, that, but, but that is, that is, that is, that is uh, seen as essential. It is not in, uh, uh, still available in, uh, in uh, well, um, large scale uh, use, uh, but is certainly uh, without that, uh, decarbonization wouldn't work. Uh, so uh, both the hydrogen and, and the carbon capture and storage are relatively neutral or even positive for employment because they need additional technology and actually the underlying processes do not uh, uh, genuinely uh, change. Uh, so, um, and at the same time, as Philip also said, uh, unlike it is the fossil energy sector like coal or, or, or gas or uh, uh, this sector is not predestined for shrinking. It is also not uh, subject to disruptive changes that the automobile industry is subject to. Uh, because this is in a way also an expanding sector in the sense that, that uh, uh, many uh, green investments, uh, uh, not least uh, in the construction sector, in retrofitting of buildings, uh, and uh, uh, we need steel, we need cement, we need plastics. Uh, for, for renewable energy generation, yes, again, also we need steel. So uh, uh, the demand for these industries will not shrink. Uh, and well, that is practical, uh, actually uh, good news for, 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 for employment. Uh, then uh, uh, 
Well, we of course know that we are in a, at a critical moment of time. We are always, yeah, but it's it's always more and more uh, coming. Uh, so we have the Green, European Green Deal that is makes sure that Europe is really committed uh, to uh, zero carbon um, uh, uh, target. Uh, we have the Fit for 55 package with all its its uh, legislative elements that are absolutely making concrete, um, very concrete uh, criteria uh, from the ETS uh, to well. Uh, we also have a carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism now. Uh, now we'll have yes, uh, and then 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 came uh, this uh, absolutely terrible assault on Ukraine by Russia. Uh, that has completely changed uh, the whole geopolitical situation and was a reminder that what we have done with all these fossil energies uh, is just uh, not sustainable, not only because of the climate, but in, in energy security terms. Uh, so uh, this, this, uh, this turn has to be uh, speed up. Uh, at the same time, we have a very difficult uh, period right now and, and in the next coming years when, when, when energy supply is uncertain, when energy supply, well, we have the, the, the huge uh, price increases, that is a huge challenge for the industry. Uh, so for the industry, there is quite an uncertain um, time now, uh, which is of course not good because uh, this is particularly an industry where, where long-term investments are necessary. So there is a long-term industrial horizon, but everything is changing quickly. So that, that makes it, uh, yeah, in a way, uh, tricky. Uh, uh, last thing to say that, that uh, uh, so we, we don't really expect uh, huge uh, disruptions, but a lot of changes. And these changes will be regionally uh, uh, different. Uh, the accessibility of new technologies like, like hydrogen and carbon capture and storage are not available uh, everywhere to the same extent. Some places are very advantageous, like the UK. The UK has huge uh, capacities for carbon capture uh, uh, storage, uh, not like other countries. Uh, and, and, but of course, it also needs an infrastructure uh, and, and build up. Uh, that is, of course, depending on industrial strategies of national level, um, these, these need uh, investment decisions, and there are different ways to do that, uh, cluster-based or all economy-based with different, uh, uh, so there are all, all, all variables that, that uh, are decisive for the, well, uh, the future of, of particular uh, places and, and industrial uh, locations. Uh, so uh, there are many, many uh, 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 critical uh, uh, elements uh, uh, to he hear. Uh, last thing why we first uh, think that there are no like disruptive changes ahead is that these industries had been transformed already. Uh, in many ways, uh, 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 in, in different ways, uh, uh, country by country. Uh, this was not due to climate policy, that was mostly global pressures, over capacities in steel, uh, uh, reductions uh, in output employment uh, in several industries, certainly steel was going through uh, uh, quite some transformation at the same time, but we also see this in the last decade, uh, well, output and employment, at least in Germany, Italy, in the major countries were rather stable. So actually output was even growing, but employment not, but, uh, but, uh, but was more or less stable. Uh, so uh, this is where we are. Uh, so in this project we have, uh, well, well, I don't know if you will do that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, we have uh, here country studies. So we have, uh, the major countries in Europe, uh, which means uh, France, Spain, Germany, UK, yeah, still an important country, uh, and Poland and Italy, uh, uh, kind of uh, national studies on, 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 on the whole uh, transformation and the industry that will be presented here. Uh, in two cases, we had an in-depth approach that uh, includes also uh, econometric modeling uh, for Germany, uh, but uh, the next presentation will also show that this is also uh, with an outlook to the EU 27, 
Uh, and on top of that, also a simulation how the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism would uh, have an impact uh, on both output uh, emissions and uh, employment. Uh, and for Poland, we also have an econometric uh, uh, outlook. Uh, we also have a case study for uh, uh, an Italian case uh, that will be part of uh, this day. Uh, so by this one, by this I just finished now. Um, and uh, well, uh, with all that, of course, and, and you will see the presentation during the day, uh, our first uh, main aim is first to, to, well, uh, to, have an, to estimate the, the employment uh, uh, factor for these necessary changes, but with a look out to the how this transformation can be made just and fair. Uh, and what policies are needed for that, uh, uh, because uh, uh, just transition policies uh, have uh, sector specifics. The European framework is not properly developed. Uh, uh, what we have is mostly uh, targeted uh, to coal in the just transition fund. Uh, and uh, we will probably have a climate social fund that is, uh, well, uh, but 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 we need, need much more uh, uh, specific policies for industries, including these ones. So by this, I finish now, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so we will uh, continue uh, with uh, the presentations. Uh, so for now, uh, I will also take over uh, to moderate uh, the. Uh, uh, session until the lunch break. Uh, so uh, in this role, I yeah invite uh, the team of uh, Cambridge Econometrics uh, uh, who were preparing us uh, together with the German uh, DEV, uh, a country study on Germany using also econometric modeling. So uh, uh, Bench, uh, uh, we'll, uh, oh, so no, uh, sorry, Dora Fadakas, uh, who is uh, the director at the Budapest office of Cambridge Economics, and uh, she will start. Thank so, you. Dora, please. Oops. Uh, I'm gonna get this out. Uh, is there anything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah good morning, out. everyone. Thank you, Bela, for the introduction. And uh, yes, yeah, so what we have done uh, together with DIW uh, in, in Berlin, we looked at the employment effects of certain decarbonization pathways uh, in these energy intensive industries that Bela has mentioned. And we also did an outlook for the EU countries and, um, and also on, on what a potential carbon border adjustment mechanism would mean for the economy, for the employment. And um, To start with, we'll uh, give you a bit of a context on, on what we have done and how we have done it. Um, so basically, we did look at the labor market impacts of these different decarbonization pathways. We will uh, discuss these pathways in, in more detail in a few minutes. Um, and, um, and to briefly present you the team that has done the work, it, um, the, the work was convened by uh, the European Trade Union Institute and ECF and Cambridge Econometrics and the IW uh, worked together on this and, um, and we were the ones, um... thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, Cambridge Econometrics, we've, uh, at, uh, we've um, designed uh, a few scenarios and a few sensitivities uh, that we will present today. And uh, the DIW team helped us with uh, putting it into the German context and really understanding what uh, scenarios might be best uh, feasible and realistic and, and uh, how that feeds into what is really happening in, in Germany. Um, and with that, I would like to ask Maria to talk a little bit about the German context, and then we will take it back. 
Thank you very much, Dora. So speaking about the energy intensive industries in uh, Germany, the uh, very important issue and uh, characteristic is that these industries are disproportionate emitters. So if you look at the figure uh, in the left, uh, it shows uh, very well that the share of uh, emissions in the total economy uh, from the energy intensive sectors is about five fold of that, uh, that the employment that uh, the energy intensive industries uh, supply in Germany. So in fact, industry in general is the second largest emitter in uh, the country and the energy intensive industries make about two thirds of that. Uh, this means that the uh, energy intensive industries uh, in Germany are very important targets for decarbonization. So they can deliver um, about the largest uh, emission savings uh, in industry in general. At the same time, the energy intensive industries uh, have quite high uh, value added. So on average, the value added contents uh, of the sectors of chemicals, uh, non-metallic minerals, and uh, base metal, basic metals per employee is higher than the average of the economy. So the important concern is, of course, when the decarbonization happens, what happens to production in these industries? And if production uh, is decreasing, are we talking here about losing jobs with higher value added content? Uh, next slide, please. Um, it is also important to note that these industries have been uh, growing in recent years, um, at least slightly. You can see in the right figure that the employment uh, is relatively stable but has grown in recent years. There is an increase in trend. At the same time, the uh, emissions do not show any significant trends. They have uh, pr been practically unchanged in the last 10 years. And on the one hand, uh, it means that uh, there have been some marginal improvements in emission intensity. But on the other hand, it also means that the challenge of decarbonizing the um, energy intensive industries in Germany in the next decades um, is uh, really significant. So uh, a lot of effort will have to be put um, to uh, reach low uh, emissions in these industries. At the same time, the uh, decarbonization will be necessary. Next slide, please. Um, Bella has spoken already about the uh, EU climate policies. Uh, we will not uh, spend a lot of time uh, at, at this stage talking about it, but of course, Dora will uh, speak more about it uh, later on when she talks about the results. Um, just as a quick introduction, uh, the uh, Fit for 55 policies uh, set out uh, the, the uh, target, uh, the policies to reach the climate targets minus 55% by uh, 2030 in emissions and uh, ultimately reaching net zero by uh, 2050 at the level of the European level. And CBAM is part of these policies, uh, which is a mechanism that should replace free allocations in uh, the emission trading system. In the proposal by the European, Com European Commission, the fully operating CBAM should be uh, introduced from 2026 onwards. Uh, since uh, the study uh, has been carried out, there also has been a proposal uh, for the improvement by the uh, European Parliament, which suggests an earlier date, uh, but it is still questionable whether this date will shift or not. Um, and uh, another important extension of the ETS uh, that is being proposed is to put transport and buildings under ETS coverage. Uh, the German climate policy uh, is somewhat more ambitious in the sense of target setting uh, in German climate law. Um, 
adopted in 2021, the net zero target by 2045 was set. And the law also specifies uh, sector uh, specific emission pathways and targets. Uh, on the economy level, uh, a reduction by um, 65 percent relative to the 1990 emission level uh, is stipulated by the law by 2030 and at least 88 percent by 2040. And an important part of German climate policy is, uh, again, also stipulated by law, um, the coal exit by 2038. Uh, in the end of last year, there were discussions about uh, speeding up the coal exit and maybe even um, envisaging uh, 2030 as the uh, exit point. Uh, however, in the current situation, the concerns are very high about uh, German dependency on Russian gas. And uh, there is a relevant share of uh, gas power generation in Germany. So for now, uh, the discussion of speeding up the coal exit is uh, likely off the table because uh, coal is uh, an unwanted but possible uh, substitute for gas in the short term. Uh, zooming in on uh, industrial policy, um, in the sectoral targets for uh, reaching the uh, net zero target, uh, industry is expected to reduce its emissions by 39% uh, relative to the 2019 level uh, by 2030. And uh, to support this, um, when the uh, recovery package, uh, recovery package uh, was adopted in 2020 uh, due to the uh, COVID crisis, and afterward at the EU level, the recovery and resilience plans were submitted, a number of support measures were um, elaborated uh, to support transition in industry, uh, which include, for example, carbon contracts for difference, uh, a number of programs for energy efficiency, both in um, other sectors like buildings and in industry, and significant support for research and development. Uh, another important pillar is the national hydrogen strategy, with, uh, which was also adopted in uh, late 2020 and uh, provides a large set of uh, goals and measures on developing uh, hydrogen use uh, in Germany, uh, hydrogen production and use primarily in industry. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings us to uh, the different options that industry has to uh, actually decarbonize production. Um, and well, the technical options are very, very similar among all the three uh, sectors, chemicals, uh, minerals, and basic materials. And so are the challenges that they face. Uh, one of the options is to electrify uh, large portions of production, which is of course uh, connected to uh, the need for affordable electricity and electricity costs in Germany are quite high, uh, quite high as of now. Uh, so the availability of cheap green electricity uh, is a big concern for uh, electrification of industrial processes. Uh, the same way hydrogen can be used in most of these uh, processes, both to generate high temperature heat and in a uh, case of the chemical industry as a feedstock to replace fossil uh, fuel feedstocks. Uh, fossil feedstocks. Um, but again, the concern is whether uh, enough green hydrogen will be uh, available in uh, medium term until 2030, for example, uh, at uh, attractive costs. Uh, a third option is to uh, use sec secondary materials, so uh, to uh, go more in direction of circular economy. Uh, here, the difficulty is, of course, uh, to make sure that uh, high quality feedstocks uh, are available, that uh, especially in terms of plastics, the waste collection separation is set in a way that uh, these feedstocks uh, can be transferred. Uh, 
in good quality to the chemical industry. Um, measures like energy efficiency improvements and use of waste heat uh, can not completely decarbonize uh, the economy, uh, the industry, but can uh, provide more efficiency. Uh, then again, the question is that uh, the capital costs are relatively high, whatever have been attractive uh, financially has been done already and uh, well, currently with rising energy costs, probably more options will become attractive, but still the capital costs are uh, a big challenge. And finally, the uh, option of using carbon capture uh, use and storage. Uh, is a viable option to uh, reduce the remaining emissions, uh, but um, it is necessary that infrastructure uh, is developed and uh, it also should be taken into account that CCS is usually a temporary measure because the possibilities to store um, the captured carbon are limited and uh, the applications where it can be used uh, are limited as well. Next to these uh, options and, and related challenges, there are also some challenges uh, which all uh, industry is uh, face in terms of decarbonization, irrespective of what technologies they use to decarbonize. So firstly, uh, decarbonized technologies tend to be more uh, expensive and currently the markets for low carbon products are insufficient. So uh, more playing certainty uh, would be necessary for these companies to know that they will have the markets to supply this low carbon products to. And this is uh, partially related, but the even bigger challenge is that uh, there are a lot of uncertainties about future uh, policies and the German regulatory and legal uh, framework is very complex. The approval procedures are very long and this especially strains the SMEs. Um, so these uh, challenges will need to be tackled if decarbonization is to be stimulated. And finally, uh, there are of course concerns about international competitiveness and uh, carbon leakage. This is what CBEM is uh, expected to tackle. And this is what Dora uh, will uh, speak about uh, later on. So, this is in a nutshell the uh, context of uh, the German industry and here I will hand over back to Dora. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> so to show you what we have been saying about what are the options and how we have done uh, the scenarios, we have basically used the Cambridge Econometrics uh, E3ME model that the E's, the three E stand for economy, environment and energy. Um, and it's a simulation-based model to reach a certain target. In this case, it's the, it's the net zero total economy target for 2045. And we specifically looked at these energy intensive sectors and, and uh, what it would mean in particular. Uh, our baseline uh, takes into account all the policies that we have been, uh, that Maria has been uh, just describing. And uh, we have designed the scenarios on top of this baseline to reach uh, even a, a more ambitious uh, decarbonization in these sectors. Um, this uh, E3ME model is, um, is used for impact assessment by, for example, the European Commission and, and various uh, international organizations and national governments. Um, and it, uh, it can look at uh, economy-wide effects, so really uh, GDP and output and, and uh, what it means for the energy sector and also employment effects that we were specifically looking at in this uh, project. Uh, plus it also has uh, bottom-up level uh, innovation modeling, really meaning that um, it takes into account not just um, historic data, so what has been happening and, and looking at uh, historic data and making the econometric estimations based on that, but also taking into account the, the, the technology changing, the, especially the, the recent changes with innovation and, uh, and what that means for the prices and, and the deployment of these technologies. Um, and, and this is what we have been using here, for example, for the steel sector. 
and uh, to show the scenarios that we have looked at. And this uh, schematic uh, figure is really just an illustrative uh, to show you that uh, these uh, three scenarios that we um, designed are, are really to capture different decarbonization pathways for these industries, uh, looking at steel and cement, fertilizers and plastics. Um, and, and as Maria was uh, explaining, what are the options in Germany for decarbonization in these sectors? We did take into account electrification and hydrogen use, biomass, uh, alternative design of materials, energy efficiency, recycling, and carbon capture and storage. But um, these three scenarios are not just um, very, uh, it, these are not, for example, the innovation-led scenario also takes into account some of the other uh, possibilities and the circularity scenario not only focuses on alternative design of the materials, but also takes into account uh, energy efficiency and recycling and biomass use. So these are really uh, illustrative scenarios. And um, so the first one is, is a, an innovation based scenario which uh, uses electrification, which uses the hydrogen. Some biomass um, has energy efficiency improvements in these three sectors and um, a bit of uh, carbon capture as well. The second scenario we did uh, analyze is, um, is a scenario which takes into account the circularity and efficiency. So not just energy efficiency, but also material efficiency using uh, better materials in these sectors, using more recyclable um, materials and uh, in these sectors. Um, and the, the third scenario is the carbon capture scenario, which, uh, which also uses some uh, electrification and biomass and, and energy efficiency. And uh, by design, these scenarios reach a net zero emission on the economy level by uh, 2045. And we um, we modeled the scenarios and, and uh, calibrated our model so that uh, the energy intensive industries uh, reach uh, a full decarbonization uh, by on the sector level by 2050. So in this project, we focused on the extra efforts needed to decarbonize these industries. Um, and now I would ask Bence to talk uh, about the, the results themselves. I'll try to move it here. Hope you can hear me all right. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, the results from, from our modeling. Uh, and I will start with, uh, with what we see, what is indicated by the modeling for, for the German economy. And then I'm going to um, switch to EU-wide results because we um, kind of extrapolated the results, extrapolated the modeling with kind of the same assumptions uh, to an EU level to, to look at just um, just the first level of the impacts that we see on an EU level if we use the same assumptions and use the same illustrative scenarios. So starting with the net economy-wide employment results uh, for, for the scenarios, and you see four scenarios here rather than three. Uh, I'm going to explain in a moment why, why that is. Uh, this is the result for, for Germany. Um, what we see basically is that uh, in the innovation and in the CCS scenario, uh, we have some negative impacts on, on the net economy uh, level. So the overall employment by 2050 is somewhat lower than it is in, in kind of a, a naive uh, decarbonization case where there is no uh, additional effort to decarbonize these sectors. Uh, if you look at the chart here, there is also uh, one bar that really, uh, really just pops out. So as I said, there are uh, actually four scenarios here. Uh, with blue, you can see the innovation. With red, you can see the CCS. And with the two kinds of, of green, you can see the, um, the circularity scenario, the energy efficiency scenario. Uh, now, the difference between the two kinds of, of the circularity scenarios here is whether we assume uh, cost pass through from the savings that are realized to alternative design and that are realized to uh, energy efficiency savings and cost savings in energy in intensive industries. If we assume what is by our literature re uh, review the more realistic case uh, for the industry to pass through uh, some of its savings, 
Uh, and when I say industry, I, I not just mean the energy intensive industry, but also downstream industries such as construction. If they pass through uh, some of the savings that they can realize to um, circularity measures and through recycling, then we can get positive uh, employment impacts. We can get positive economic impacts in the overall economy because savings are going to be passed through to consumers. Consumers can increase their consumption, and that can lead to uh, that can lead to uh, positive employment gains. But if there is no passing through of, of those uh, savings, so if savings is is basically goes into profits of of those aforementioned companies, then what we see is kind of the largest negative impact in this simulation or in this in this modeling effect. Um, in the next slide, I'm just gonna um, zoom into to those results that we have. So uh, this chart now leaves out that case when there is no cost pass through of, of savings. Uh, and what you can see here is that we have these um, negative, but as Bela mentioned, these are not, um, these are not really uh, like tragic effects uh, on, on an economy level, uh, even though jobs are lost um, in, in the innovation. And in the CCS case, we see that these are um, in, in, in the numbers of, of a few thousand uh, maximum on, on a net economy level. In the same time, in the circularity scenario, we see gains. And those gains are uh, especially driven by these kind of consumption substitution effects. So costs are being saved in the simulation because of recycling, because of energy efficiency, and those are passed through to consumers, which can lead to, to these gains. And what I also want to just give you a, a quick overview of is, is what this means in, in composition terms on, on the labor force and what this means in, in the specific energy intensive industries uh, that we, we've been talking about. So first on the, on the left side, uh, on the left chart really, what you can see is, uh, is how these net effects are, are actually built up. Uh, and the most important thing here is, is what's in the middle. So I've been talking about this, this circularity scenario and how that can lead to the positive impact. But these positive impacts, positive employment gains are really conditional. And they are conditional on whether a large scale transformation of the, of the labor force is possible. Uh, because what you can see here is why the net effect is positive it comes with a high positive impact in sectors other than EEI and a large, a considerable negative effect in energy intensive industries. So if that kind of uh, transformation of the labor force through these next 30 years, a bit more than 30 years is possible uh, and it can, can be done to um, supported reskilling um, or, or, or labor market transformation, then, then it is a possible scenario. Otherwise, uh, there are um, issues there. Um, and I'm gonna move on and, and talk a bit about the, the EU results that we got from the simulation. Um, in some cases, they are really similar to the German results, but I want to, uh, want to just highlight some, some other uh, important impact, uh, aspects that uh, we think is yeah, is important to talk about. So composition is, is really similar on the EU-wide level as well. Uh, but what we also did in the study is, is looked at how different financing schemes can have uh, different effects on, on employment or employment outcomes in the different scenarios. Uh, so we considered in the first case um, an endogenous financing scenario, which basically means that new money is available for financing these abatement measures. So you can think about green bonds or you can think about new green financing schemes that are especially for financing abatement that bring in new money to these sectors, uh, which was not available for these sectors before. Uh, that's the best case. That's the blue line actually here in all of the scenarios. Uh, but what we also see is when other types of financing is considered. So uh, if we consider full public financing, that's the green line actually, or we consider full private financing with crowding out, which basically means that sectors need to finance their own um, abatement from their existing investments. So 
they won't do what they were planning to do in, in terms of productive investment, but they will do abatement instead. That can bring actually um, the worst employment outcomes because investment in that case is really concentrated. Investment in that case is, is really crowd, crowds out these other types of productive investments. So that's, um, that's something that, that shows us that there might be some, there might be a need for bringing up in uh, money for these kind of abatement measures from new sources. And there is a need for public financing some of these um, investments. And yeah, I'm just, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just quickly going to show you this. And if there is any questions about uh, kind of the territory effects, we're going to talk about that later. But what I really want to talk about, and uh, I'm going to use two minutes of those three to talk about this, is how there are trade-offs in all scenarios, how there are trade-offs in, in all kinds of pathways that we are talking about. Uh, if we look at net labor outcomes or um, energy intensive industry employment, there are trade-offs there. So we see that in the circularity effect, there is this positive effect on, on the economy wide level, but there is a uh, negative effect on the energy intensive industries. The opposite is true. And if we implement carbon capture and storage, uh, but what I want to further highlight is how, what we see in the carbon capture and storage is, is offset, that negative uh, effect is offset by what happens in the innovation uh, scenario. Because basically in the carbon capture and storage scenario, we lose some of the investment that would be other, otherwise needed for decarbonization. Because we lose that investment that is needed for innovation, that is needed for hydrogen production, that is needed for electrification. And it means less jobs basically, uh, if CCS is, is implemented because uh, it means that less transformation is necessary even within the sector. And what we see is that in the innovation scenario where uh, we are transitioning to hydrogen, we are transitioning to electricity, there is in the economy a uh, higher need for these investments, a higher need for technology development. And that actually brings us new jobs uh, that wouldn't be available with kind of the easier solution. And with that, I'm going to hand to Dora to conclude. Maybe one word of the CBAM. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and let's just get back to the CBAM if we have questions as well. Uh, so I'm just going to go here for the CBAM. Uh, there is a lot to talk about the CBAM. That could be a whole other session as well. Uh, but there are just two things that I, I want to highlight really. So in our modeling, in our simulations, the CBAM has positive impacts on all of the scenarios. But there is one thing that we, that we need to consider, and that is what uh, Mario talked about, the kind of the secondary material or raw material challenge. Um, and I'm also happy to talk about the phasing out of free allocations later. Uh, but the raw material challenge is if the CBAM is applied to, to raw materials, secondary materials that are coming in as, a, as an input for recycling, coming in as an input for processes, production processes, uh, or simulations show that reaching abatement goals can be a lot harder uh, because it can, it can displace uh, processes that are from a, an emission perspective are really beneficial. Um, for example, recycled steel production, uh, it can make the cost of those uh, processes much higher and by our simulations, it can mean that uh, actually achieving those abatement goals that we take for granted um, can be harder with three to eight percentage points. So the abatement that we need because of those process transitions could be uh, three to eight uh, percentage points higher. And yeah, let me hand it over and we can get back to that if there are any questions. Thanks, okay, I'll be very quick. And um, yeah, this is a slide just summarizing what we have done and really how the circular economy scenario decreases the employment but creates job gains in other sectors. So on, a, on an economy level, it has positive effects and uh, the other two uh, scenarios uh, create more employment in the energy intensive industries, but employment decreases in the other sectors. So it was very interesting to look at the difference between the scenarios. Um, and 
just to conclude, we thought uh, we can't really uh, not mention the, um, the current geopolitical uh, circumstances and, and the repower EU, although our modeling does not take this into consideration because it was started before. Uh, the war, uh, but the repower EU is, is really a quickened low carbon tr uh, transformation. And, um, and uh, this really resembles the innovation scenario that we have designed. Um, but of course, there are uncertain uncertainties about the innovation outcomes and, and the technological feasibility. But, uh, but it, it does look interesting to see what might happen and, and how our scenario might even uh, um, project what, what uh, could be happening. Uh, so just we thought it's important to mention that uh, there is a there is investment necessary to fund these uh, innovations, and if this investment is raised, then we might see an acceptable labor outcome uh, on a wide uh, economy wide level, uh, and that would need renewable energy, more renewable energy, and and hydrogen, and that would really create uh, good economic and and employment opportunities. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dora, Benson, and Maria. Uh, thank you really for this uh, very interesting input and, and that, that reminds us that there are important policy choices, uh, which is um, a kind of um, really uh, important message. Um, we will have discussion after the break. So now we go uh, over to Poland to, to uh, Alexander Spohr uh, from Instruct Institute in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, let's see how does it look like from a Polish perspective. Uh, Oleg, you have 20 minutes. Okay, Sorry. I'm just having problem to switch yeah. on the presentation mode. It's, it's already mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, but uh, I wanted to make it full screen. Um, So actually, which one? Which one do we? Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, I I can share this one actually. Yeah, just a PowerPoint would be better. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's just no, I need to works. switch the um, the windows. I just don't use the small ones. You can. Okay, so then. Sorry, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you very much, Pera, and I'm happy to to be here. And I really look forward for this to the discussion. Uh, but first, I would like, like to present a few uh, results of our research that we conducted in Poland in our Instruct team. Um, uh, the as Dora mentioned, this this bulk of this work was done prior to the. A war in uh, in Ukraine, uh, and uh, so so you need to take into account that certain results are may differ from, uh, from during the last three months. Um, so my presentation is divided into five points. Uh, I would like to say shortly about the methods and sources that we explored and, and applied. Uh, I would like to give you the context of the uh, industrial emissions and go then to more into in-depth analysis of the energy intensive industries. Um, then I would like to share with you some results of our uh, input output model that we created. And finally, uh, in the last point, I would like to mention um, technological change perspectives in Poland and potentially and, and instruments that, that could potentially make the difference um, and speed up the, 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 the process of technological change. So um, we 
started obviously from the desk research where we revised the docu policy documents and data sources, the obvious one I won't even mention, but maybe the only one that, that may be more interesting is the EPRTR, which is a register of the of this 11,000 facilities that fall on, under the EU ETS uh, system. Uh, so that helped us to overcome some limitations in terms of uh, granularity of data in, uh, for instance, Euro Eurostat or, or uh, EA or Statistics Poland. Um, then we, we had this eight interviews, uh, as I mentioned, mostly done last year, beginning of this year, January. And, uh, um, and thirdly, we, we built this model, input output model to see uh, what are the, what could be the results of potential faster uh, track in terms of decarbonizations. Uh, in power sector, but also the, the impacts for the for this for uh, energy intensive industries. So the, about the context, um, maybe two important things that you you need to know uh, before we go further is that one is that um, Polish industry and especially manufacturing uh, is part is particularly important for the growth in Poland. Uh, it turns out it turned out to be both in uh, 2008 crisis and now with the pandemia uh, crisis it turned out to be quite uh, resist resilient to to economic crisis so so the fall in terms of uh, economic uh, output the, f the fall was quite uh, um, small and uh, like, like the countries uh, in uh, Central Eastern Europe, we are quite industrialized uh, country. Now, the second thing is that uh, this manufacturing sector is uh, quite emission intensive. So as you can see in the uh, left uh, hand side uh, graph, the volume of emissions is quite high in, po in manufacturing, in Polish manufacturing. But also, when you look at the uh, mm, emissions per uh, per added value, um, then you also see that uh, with countries like uh, Bulgaria, Greece, Cyprus ahead of us, and Slovakia, sorry, uh, we are fifth uh, fifth biggest uh, manufacturing emitter in, uh, in in the EU. So it it would show probably you would you would see that quite intuitively that um, manufacturing kind of represents the size of the Polish economy or of the author of, of, of Poland in, in the EU. Whereas you can see in the right side that it's quite, it seems to be quite um, carbon intensive. Um, now, um, if you look at total, uh, at the emissions from the economy, from industries, and so, so this is the whole economy without households. This is uh, around 300, uh, 300 million tons of uh, CO2 emissions. And 18% of that are the four energy intensive industries that we picked uh, for further study. Uh, only 3% in total uh, of the emissions are other, in the, uh, other energy intensive industries as plastics or paper and so on. So, so basically that was the, um, that was the, the, the uh, result, based on this result, we picked those four to, to go further with the study and, and with interviews and so on. Um, obviously the, the size of emissions, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the share of coal in energy mix makes, uh, explains why the half of the total emissions are from, uh, from energy production but this is um, this is quite obvious, as I'm sure you you're aware of Polish carbon intensity, coal intensity. Now, I won't bother you too much with the regional distributions, but what is uh, what is perhaps interesting in this, uh, and what was actually interesting for myself, uh, um, was to discover that not uh, not the regions which are the usual suspects in terms of emissions, like Upper Silesia, uh, where the heart of the coal regions is and, and the most developed uh, coal uh, 
uh, mines are, are located. But uh, but a region like Shentokshiske, which is quite rural region with small cities rather, and uh, I wouldn't say it's very significant in terms of uh, um, general impact on Polish economy. Now it turned out to be um, to be quite intensive. And this is our focus, maybe I will talk about it uh, in the discussion. This is our approach that we would like to continue with this after this project, that for some regions, so the conclusion is that the, for some regions, these industrial emissions constitute a bulk of their emissions. So in terms of regional policies, um, this is quite a substantial, this can be this focus point for regions to concentrate on while thinking about the reduction of emissions actually that happened already in uh, one of the regions uh, um, Wielkopolska where Zepak mine is uh, located and the region decided that we will shut down earlier the coal mine and this will bring enormous gains in terms of total emissions of, from the region so this strategy of the whole region up to 20 until 2040 is to be carbon neutral which when you take into consideration Polish uh, negligence on, of 2050 new carbon neutrality is kind of important in, in political, uh, let's say, play in, in Poland. Now, now let me go to further to this to this four energy intensive industries that we selected. These are cement, chemicals, smelting being mostly steel and iron, but also we decided to include copper. Uh, um, um, uh, smelting and petrochemicals. Uh, so now we just just this shift you need to before looking at this at the slide, uh, which you need to make is that so far we were basing on statistics Poland. Now we are going into different data source. So we are talking about more or less half of the emissions that of the total economy. Uh, which are registered in the EU ETS and in the EPRTR uh, uh, data source. So, so we, we now focus on the industrial facilities from four energy intensive uh, industries that are important players in terms of uh, total EU ETS emissions. So Within the whole Polish uh, register, there is 170 million tons of CO2 um, produced uh, each year. And um, so this is data for 2019, but let's say this is approximately last, last year, this was the, the average. And uh, the four selected uh, industrial um, uh, energy in the intensive industries produce 40 million tons of it, which is, uh, a bit more than 20, 20%. Now, the highest emissions again are the, in the same. So if you compare two sources of data, still this Shentokrzyskie Województwo, uh, but also Śląskie, Mazowieckie due to Orlen uh, seat are, are still there. But also for instance, small uh, Wojewodczyk as Opolskie as well, uh, they, are, they are kind of, Mm, surprising, uh, surprising uh, results of this of this uh, data analysis. Now, if you, I know that there are some funds of name and shame strategy, so maybe you would be interested to see who are those the biggest polluters. Uh, but so, so you have in the four tops uh, uh, position of this ranking, you would have four different energy intensive industries. Uh, representative of those four energy intensive industries. So Orlen, which I mentioned earlier, this is the main producer of, um, of uh, refined petroleum products. Uh, so transport fuels basically, uh, which shortly be, uh, which is now discussed to, be, to merge with Lotus. So in the second black uh, uh, row, you can see uh, this, this, could be, this could be merged. So in future, maybe next year, this, this emissions would be combined. Uh, now, then next one is ArcelorMittal. I don't have to present who is, uh, which sector is that. Grupa Azoty, which is uh, the, the largest, largest Polish producer of fertilizers. Um, and then three next positions are cement producers and cement facilities. Um, now, let me go to 
to the modeling part of our of our um, project. Um, model which is uh, created by my colleague Wojciech Rabiega, who is also with us in online. But I, for the sake of, of uh, for the fact I'm being here, I, I will present it. But but uh, I hope for the discussion and Wojtek is ready ready to your questions. Um, so what we did uh, in uh, to see what are the potential results of uh, faster decarbonizations in Poland. So we essentially we built this input output model, and we created two scenarios. Usually you create a baseline scenario, so you kind of see what are the trends and what would be the future if any changes wouldn't uh, if any major changes wouldn't be implemented. Now. To construct this alternative scenario, we we used our um, paper from the last year, uh, achieving the goal, which is based on Pipesum model. That is a model that helps to uh, this Python uh, power sector analysis model. So uh, we created the scenario where uh, of, of very fast and, to my knowledge, the most ambitious pathway of decarbonization of electricity production in Poland, um, in which you would have in 2030 already 76% of renewables in the energy mix compared to currently 26. So as you can imagine, this is a very ambitious one. Uh, but so we believe that technologically it's, it's doable. Uh, aside the questions of uh, business cycles, investment cycles, etc., and many other constraints that may be of political nature, we, we believe that this is a feasible, uh, technically feasible scenario. Now, uh, so we used the capital expenditures, uh, we calculated using this ex experience of, of, of former uh, modeling exercise. Uh, we calculated what would be the cost, the operating costs, uh, sorry, exp operating expenditures uh, of fuels uh, that would be used or would not be used anymore. And uh, based on that, we saw what is the distributions of this uh, shock, as we call it. So the expenditure which you need to exp uh, uh, make are, are a shock for an economy. So here in the slide, you, you can see the results altering from the baseline scenario, right? So we see that in some sectors, um, in most of the sectors, actually positive in impact of uh, positive in, uh, investments, apart from the, uh, apart from the, of course, coal sector, and in the last uh, decade, uh, oil sector as well, uh, along with the carbonizations of transport. Now, what this shock, uh, which is written, uh, so if you sum up the um, negative and positive uh, um, uh, expenditures, you have this black uh, line uh, on the graph. And the same black line is in the next slide. So this shows, uh, so, so based on this uh, shock and throughout the input output model, we could see the that the major positive impact in terms of employment, both employment and output change, uh, would be between 20, 25, 2030, which is obviously related to the biggest burden of this, this decade in terms of investment and, uh, and slow decline in terms of, uh, of positive gains. But still, the results are, are positive, and they reach, for instance, in terms of labor, for the whole economy, I mean now, uh, it would be up to even uh, 500, five hundred half million uh, jobs. But if we look at the picture, not not of the whole economy, but of the selected industries that we see interesting, now uh, you see negative impacts in terms of uh, labor markets in coal sector, obviously, uh, and this is this uh, black. Uh, color and the positive impacts, um, especially in as again in between 2025 20, 2030. 20, uh, 
obviously we can discuss whether this uh, scenario which is very ambitious of, of power of change in the power sector is doable or not but with that we came up with the conclusion that regardless of what would be the actual pace of uh, reduction of emissions in the power sector we see more or less the so we can build other scenarios and and we see more or less what is the uh level of impact so what is the proportion of impact of this uh of this um shock to to the economy now maybe we, we did some uh quite a lot of analysis of uh, job quality uh, according to various uh, uh, in indexes uh, or um, and and uh, but i will show you only just one that uh this the the wage uh, wages in industry and manufacturing are quite uh high they are above average so based on interviews uh we assume that with higher skills of obviously as as my colleague mentioned earlier with the right policies of uh, upskilling reskilling etc uh we could we could assume that the the average salaries would even uh, grow faster than in uh, in other for instance in uh, services and and um also if you look for instance at other indicators such as uh accidents in the work and uh, number of hours uh, per week they are all becoming more positive in terms of reduced number of hours per, uh, per month sorry or less accidents uh, higher safety and so on so we believe that this this is just a good investment that that's the that's the conclusion and last but not least uh technological change so uh, mostly out of desk research and interviews uh verified in interviews we confirmed that all the major technologies that are put forward in the current discussion, current debate, and are considered by the industries across Europe, but not only Europe, in, in across all major industrial uh, uh, countries, uh, that they are in place. But two information important here are that the time frame is rather 2040 than 2030. In most of it, maybe with one or two exceptions and of course often we heard the the answer as many of these companies are just uh, um, owned by other foreign companies uh, we heard often for instance the answer well the the final decision is not up to us so what we are trying to do because it's not us who will decide whether this technology this new technology will be applied in Poland or maybe prior to Poland it will be applied in other countries because of economic conditions in other countries so so uh, I assume there there was limited belief that there is something we can do in Poland to speed up the decarbonization process so we're trying to uh, come over this this uh, idea this this challenge Ah, maybe uh, just one uh, additional slide right. that obviously with the rising prices of co2 emissions with um, uh, i'm sorry this is in polish but but the uh, this sorry so the blue line is um, average price of electricity uh, at uh, retail market and the orange line is uh, CO2 emissions prices. So with the two uh, market signals, the, the industry we believe is more prone to consider more ambitious uh, pathways. And, and obviously the, the situation in Ukraine and uh, in Russia, uh, which if we talk only about these four sectors, it's a very important supplier of steel to Poland at least, but also to the EU. Uh, both countries uh, with oil gas etc this 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 pace is is expected to to grow much faster than than just two months ago we, we or three months ago we would consider now uh the last slide before my conclusions uh would be that we're looking at different of obviously different um, instruments policy instruments that 
um, that uh, are important in, in uh, industrial policy in Poland. And we were, of course, discussing about them with our, um, in our interviews. So perhaps the, uh, given the profile of, of the people we, we selected for the, for the companies, we heard uh, the interest of industries in big num round numbers. So, so that's what the industry likes. So they are, they are interested in derogations, compensations, because this is, these are not even millions, these are billions. And this is something tangible, which can be easily or not maybe not easily, but can be is, is a target in, in any case for them. But uh, we want, we believe in this regional approach in, in terms of speeding up the process of decarbonization. So we were trying to look at the instruments apart from uh, also energy prices. This, this, can be, this can be discussed as maybe further. So we were actually interested in instruments that we could affect. And that's why we believe this sector deal, which some of you may know from UK, is our potential target in terms of um, um, in terms of instrument that can deliver the, the highest uh, change in terms of decarbonization. So we heard from the businesses that they would consider on the one on their side, for instance, contract for difference as a as a tool. Uh, so they would uh, they would like to have or maximal electricity price, and in return, the government could expect that the currently planned uh, decarbonization pace can be increased. And this is the deal that we we believe can be done also at the regional level. And and we we hope to be active in this field um, right after the project. So last slide, um, just with the conclusions. So you know the you, you you've seen that the GD, the industry and manufacturing both are important part of the G, of the economic growth in Poland. They are offering stable, good wages and good uh, working conditions compared to other um, sectors. Uh, yet the problem is of high carbon intensity. Now, um, we believe in this regional approach and uh, that at least some of the regions where the cement or steel production or, or refinery uh, is uh, intensive, we believe that they, they could approach this uh, issue uh, with, new, uh, with new instruments. Uh, we know for a fact that investments in higher, um, in faster change in electricity sector would positively affect the energy intensive uh, industries. And this is quite intuitive. And if you think of steel and cement that you need to build, uh, that you need to build new capacity for, uh, capacities uh, of, of uh, renewables, including renewables. But also, um, there are there are some technologies that are on the horizon, but but they are like industries are rather shy to uh, shy to put ambitious uh, dates into into implementation of the, these technologies. And finally, we believe in the sector too that that this is could be a break uh, break uh, this could be a breaking instrument in terms of uh, decarbonization process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Oleg. So it was really good to hear that that uh, more ambition uh, and more jobs. Uh, so a quite an optimistic tone uh, um, uh, for Poland. Um, that's very good. Uh, we will have discussion after the break uh, on both uh, uh, presentations. So we have now ten minutes. Um, right. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, we will continue. Well, well, if possible, around 11 already. Uh, I mean, this clock is a little bit uh, going behind, but yeah. yeah. I will uh, introduce them later. So, uh, well, yeah, so then, okay, so, then Marcus, you were then quicker, uh, and then Benjamin. Or you, please, yeah, sorry, with the mask, I don't even see you perfectly. Yeah, I'm sorry for that, yeah. Uh, think, uh, Michael, yeah, Michael, yes, uh, probably there is. Um, 
Uh, so, uh, from your presentations, uh, I had the impression that overall uh, decarbonation of EIIs in Germany would have a global negative impact, uh, generally speaking, whereas in Poland it would have a general positive impact. So, how would you explain the differences between the two countries? Uh, why does the same decarbonation process uh, has, have such uh, different impacts in two neighboring countries? Uh, okay. Be, be, be take the one by Benjamin and then also Milan just after Benjamin uh, behind and and then with the three uh, we are now well okay good good morning Benjamin Denis uh, industrial Europe sorry I missed the, the start of the day and uh, your your presentation uh, Benson and Dora uh, precisely because uh, we we are um, uh, discussing with uh, with our members um, the different proposals that will be voted next week in the European Parliament on ETS and, and CBAM. Um, as you might know, there are a series of crunchy issues on the table, and notably um, the phase down and phase out of uh, free allowances and the timing to introduce the, the CBAM. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, it's sure that um, given what is currently on the table, the carbon price is, is expected to uh, remain high and possibly increase in, in the coming years. Uh, we also have to uh, struggle with uh, an unprecedented energy crisis, which brings energy costs, but also electricity costs uh, really high. Um, and my, my question to you is uh, really simple. How do you factor in in your modeling exercise those uh, different elements and, and notably um, the free allowances timing, the phase out timing, as well as the, the timing to implement the CBAM? How does it impact your, your, your forecasts? Okay, uh, we, we collect, uh, uh, yes, so Milan, please, and then. Uh... So you started off the presentation by stating that social dialogue, uh, social policies, employment policies, and uh, there was, sorry, one last one, are all policies that could be enacted to help the just transition going on. I'll be interested to hear what can policymakers learn from your results and especially what kind of policies can be designed in a way that they facilitate the just transition and how effective they are under different scenarios uh yeah uh, so thank you we have uh, three interesting questions uh uh first uh then later i will uh, i will bring in uh, some from the online uh chat uh so uh maybe we go in the order of um, the appearance uh, before. So Dora and Bentha, uh, if you can react. Uh, so so first on, on, on the possible differences or how you see that. Uh, uh, and uh, then um, Benjamin and... I think uh, I will try to answer the maybe the, the last question and then leave Bensa to to answer the more technical questions. But um, so yeah, what kind of policies? What we can learn? How effective they are? So it's it's indeed why we do this kind of modeling. To we are not saying we are doing a prognosis. We are not saying this is what will happen. We are just. Um, projecting these different scenarios and, and making sure that compared to each other, we can learn from what are the differences between them and uh, what might be, for example, some uh, policy takeaway is for the policy design is uh, very, I think, very important to mention the financing of these measures that the Benz presented that either it comes from public financing or private financing. Um, and, and that has a different impact. Um, and, and also the just transition policies, what it means, how to design it, what if we know that there are sectors where employment will be affected, then how can we already prepare for it? How can we do trainings and skill, um, yeah, um, target the skills mismatches that might 
arise. So these are these are the things that can really uh, be useful for for policymakers, in in my opinion. And uh, Dominic, you asked about the the timing of of reallocation and phase out and CBAM. And um, yeah, just to say that we have taken into account what is on the table that as we knew it currently when we were designing the policies and and that's what we put into the model so that uh, the yeah the free allocation would be phased out um and um and the CBAM would start 2025 yes, yes. Yeah. but yeah you can yeah <laughs> um I'm, I'm just gonna continue from from exactly that uh so i will try to to just share some thoughts and say something about what we see in the modeling um, in, in relation to the free allocation. So what, what are the assumptions basically that we, we um, use that? And then about the differences, just uh, to finish where, where Alexandra can uh, start. Um, so on the free allocations, the, the CBAM and the phasing out of free allocations, I think is one of the most difficult questions uh, related to, to CBAM, related to industry, related to the, the FIT1255 package, if we are coming from, uh, from an industry side. Now, what we do in the, in the modeling, and this is kind of the common approach, and this is, I think, also something that, that many of the um, opinions are, are based on, and many of the arguments are based on, is, is, is this kind of, uh, I mentioned this word uh, already in previous workshop, but there is this kind of opportunity cost approach. And, and the opportunity cost approach basically um, assumes and basically have this, this um, understanding that when the ATS uh, system was introduced, uh, all the ATS costs and expected costs of the ETS uh, were something that companies actually factored into their prices. So. If you take this assumption, this means that with the introduction of the CBAM, there should be no uh, price increases, there should be no cost increases, either in domestic, EU domestic, or in, in export prices. However, uh, we do know, and we get this from, from various discussions, that this might not be entirely the case. And there has been a study by C. Delft uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2020, where they looked at, at whether this, this assumption holds or, or, or it doesn't hold or what happens. And what they've seen is that um, companies um, who are covered under the ETS were able to, to gain, obtain uh, additional profits from passing through costs of the ETS and from basically because there was overall allocation in the system. But uh, they also made this, this, really important, uh, this really important point that the allocation among companies of these profits uh, might be really disproportional. So what, what I mean by that is that why there were some firms who, who were probably able to, to factor in these prices, these costs of the ETS uh, from the point that it started and who were able to, to gain excess profits because of this, there might be some other, usually more domestic, uh, usually smaller firms who were not able to, to do that and who might face uh, a higher burden if free allocations are being let out, if the CBAM is, is introduced in parallel and, and so on. So, in the modeling, in, in the simulation, we look at economy-wide and we look at sectoral efforts. What we don't do, and I think that's an important limitation, and I'm at, the point, at, at this moment, I'm not aware of, of any simulation or modeling-like exercise that would do this. Uh, we are not looking at um, distributions within sectors. So how different type of firms, different scale, different, um, yeah, different size of firms are affected in very different ways. And this is that something that might be really important when, when considering free allocations and when considering the introduction of the CBAM, because even though we, we show an overall positive effect of, of the CBAM, it might be a disproportional effect. It might um, actually have, have um, not so good effect as we show in some firms uh, who are really vulnerable and who are really 
um, in the EU market in, in, in some ways. Sorry, that was a, that was a long answer, but um, I, I try to make that clear. And on the differences, so I'm, I'm just gonna give two, I think, important points where we, where we differ in the approach that we take. Uh, one is that, as, as Dora said in the beginning, uh, we were basing on our, um, on our scenarios already on, on a case where Germany and in the EU case, the EU, is going for a net zero target, is going for um, a net zero economy, not just in the energy intensive sectors, but outside of that as well. So what we see in our modeling is the marginal effect, the marginal impact of decarbonizing energy intensive industries. Uh, and we don't necessarily see the positive impacts that are coming in um, from, from energy, power generation sector decarbonization, which we do see uh, in the Polish case. Um, and we see the other side of that. Another point that, um, that, that might um, explain the differences is we are considering, and this is explained more clearly in the, in the report and the materials, but we are um, considering um, a revenue recycling mechanism, which means that ETS revenues that are, are captured in the model are recycled for societal uses, basically, um, setting the level of, of, of taxation in the overall economy. And what this means is in the case where we have CCS, for example, um, the government, the illustrative governments in the model are losing revenues. And as they are losing revenues, they are losing these uh, otherwise uh, gain carbon taxes, which can have um, other economic effects and that can have an effect on, uh, on sectors that are outside of the energy intensive space. So um, that is a, a consideration that we have in the modeling that, and that is somewhat counterintuitive, but that is a, um, an assumption that we had in the modeling that government revenues can be actually higher if less decarbonization is happening. Uh, because carbon tax is collected in, in that case, and that can have these, um, these other effects on employment. So there is, again, kind of a trade-off uh, that we see there for us. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. And then, uh, Olek, if you had uh, something on, on um, Polish perspective. Okay. So uh, I'm not a modeler, uh, I'm a political scientist, so I'm not very qualified to assess the structural difference of these models, and how, but I think part of the answer you already, you already have. Now, what I know, uh, uh, there was a question about the EU ETS, for instance. So I know for a fact that the EU ETS in input-output uh, tables is seen as a certain uh, as a part of goods and services that are produced so whenever a, a company has to uh, bear the cost of the eu ets it it makes it part of of its sold production or services so so this is part of the answer and the another part which i'm not very sure so maybe Wojtek, my colleague would confirm that maybe Wojtek can add uh, also other things but also, you need to remember that the uh, price on EU ETS is redistributed then in, by the, in Polish case, this is a National Fund for Environmental Protection um, and longer name, but whatever. So this is redistributed in the economy back, back again. So, so it's not necessarily the cost in the total economy, right? Mm -hmm. So this is part of the, the answer. Um, so the policies of just transition, um, well, I didn't mention that in my presentation, but and, uh, but this is a very important thing to remember that the whole budget of the uh, um, just transition mechanism, uh, so both just transition fund and the two other pillars, is currently spent on the coal regions in Poland. And everybody knows why. So what we do with this project is we want to flag, and I, to my understanding, we are kind of first in among at, at least think tanks, which flag that this is going to be a problem very soon, or this is already a problem, but this is just in the shadow of, of coal sector. And what we want to do is just to make clear to the different stakeholders that this is just right behind the coal sector. And, and actually we should start to think about it now because 
this is the best time to think of the next uh, financial perspective, hopefully, hopefully prolonged uh, just transition mechanism in this or, or that form. <laughs> And the future streams that should go and embrace also the uh, cement, steel, etc. regions where, where these problems occur, because they are not always uh, in terms in case of Silesia, Upper Silesia, for instance. This is the same region which requires, for different reasons, the, the same fund. But we have different uh, regions where no coal, but very intensive energy intensive industries exist. So, so this is part of our narrative that we yeah, promote. Uh Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, bring in uh, at least two questions uh, from the uh, online um, uh, participants. Uh, one uh, was about, uh, so coming from uh, outside Europe uh, and raising a little bit the perspective of uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, the first thing was about uh, biologic carbon removal uh, by uh, using oceans uh, uh, to uh, remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere, uh, to what extent uh, this could uh, play uh, a role in well, uh, capturing carbon. And then uh, also uh, the whole uh, CBAM, uh, from a developing country perspective, uh, how those countries might be affected. Uh, then there was one, uh, given the, the rather positive picture um, we had here on employment, uh, in particular for the Polish case, but, but some refer uh, here also to uh, Western European uh, 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 trends. Uh, how does this will go with, uh, given the labor shortage that we have in the question puts it in Western Europe, but actually we have labor shortage all over and in Poland uh, as well. Uh, so uh, uh, how, 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 how uh, uh, skill development and actually, uh, yeah, um, migration uh, might play a role. Uh, I saw in the Polish slides that uh, Poland is actually counting on foreign labor, uh, which is rather kind of uh, interesting phenomenon. So uh, I'll let you uh, to deal with these, um, yeah, possibly well in just five minutes. So, so I mean, not five, five, but <laughs> yeah, if, if possible. Yes. Yeah, so, so about the uh, about instruments of uh, adjusting labor force uh, foreign uh, from abroad. Um, this is obviously, and this is part of the. This is an instrument named in the draft of the Polish poli uh, Polish uh, industrial policy, which is not accepted by the government yet. And to my knowledge, it's not clear it, if it's going ever to be, or will there ever be any. A new policy document that would be over um, overwritten. Uh, this is due to political shifts, and um, but what I know is that this this instrument was drafted before the war, so we didn't consider, we didn't have uh, even thought about the conflict that and the migration wave that came to Poland right now, and. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that we have clear picture what is going to, how the this, uh, I don't know, two millions now of Ukrainians uh, will affect the labor market in Poland. I, the important thing is to know that this is not um, labor migration. This is different type of migration. So uh, many people are coming uh, just to stay for a moment, just hoping that they will return. So this is just to me. This is I, I didn't come across any any study that would try to even forecast what will be the impact of the recent wave. So, but we obviously we were thinking and we were much relying on uh, mostly Eastern uh, can, Eastern European countries uh, in terms of labor market. Now, important thing to remember is that 
in all the sectors we uh, talk to, the expectation is that the skills will be higher and higher. So you will uh, no longer have simple skill, uh, skills that uh, basic skills that are sufficient to fulfill the industrial jobs. You will have only higher and higher skills. And for many companies which are localized in very remote areas, as for instance, cement, fact, uh, cement plants, the labor market, the regional local labor market is a very, uh, is a very problematic issue. So even for those guys who are responsible for big finances and big billions, even they understand that the uh, education for these industries, for the particular jobs that are, uh, will be needed there takes time it's usually more than one year it's usually two or three years to get a fully qualified uh, employer and and so the language barrier uh is there so in terms of in terms of language uh ukrainian and slovak and slovenian are the most three most uh, similar languages so i'd say the language barrier is spanish italian let's say uh but uh, all the other uh, nations have a high la a polish language is one of the most difficult languages uh world in the world so i, I top top 10 i guess or something like this so you need to remember that to fully highly of course the businesses can go english which is not the case yet so this i would see this rather as an opportunity than than uh employing large number quantities of, of employers from abroad yeah. okay uh, so um, uh, as short as possible yeah very shortly um, and I agree with what you've just said but um, and also taking into account not just the labor shortages but also the, the big mega trends that are happening that you mentioned in your um, beginning of the presentation, so really what automation, digitalization, and then the population change might mean for the labor market is also a, a factor that we need to take into account. Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, we would still have a lot of things to discuss, uh, but um, uh, we have to move on. Uh, so uh, we will just uh, uh, take uh, the uh, next uh, presentations, um, uh, France and Spain. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, oh, yeah, maybe I have. Uh, yeah, for moderating, I'm sure uh, is not true. Uh, oh, yeah, good. <laughs> so, the right way. Uh, so, then, uh, so the next uh, two uh, cases uh, will be France uh, first, then Spain. Uh, these studies uh, had been uh, prepared in collaboration with the Sendex uh, group uh, based uh, in both countries. And uh, first uh, we will have uh, uh, Jose Jesus uh, to present uh, France. Exactly. Please, yes, and well, actually, 20 minutes, if I may ask. Uh, um, then we will go on with France and avoid with Spain and then discuss the two before the last break. So, please. Okay, thank you, everyone. It's okay, the song. Thank you, everyone, to, for coming. Uh, very interesting approach. Uh, for Germany and for Poland, very interesting modeling system. Uh, our approach, uh, it was quite different. Uh, we usually work with trade unions and uh, for uh, EWC committees and for uh, national committees. Uh, we are implanted in 
six countries all around Europe. And our commitment is without workers and uh, we visit, uh, usually we, we know uh, very well the sectoral, uh, at sectoral level, the industries, we visit plants, we usually discuss with the trade unions, also with um, the direction. Uh, so um, our approach is more uh, uh, at field level. Uh, although we did um, uh, interesting and deep uh, desk research and taking into account uh, national policies, um, sectoral uh, industry uh, level policies, and uh, the technologies, also the, the evolution of technology, uh, uh, who uh, which uh, we really know um, especially for steel sector um, but also chemical and, and cement sector and non-ferrous metals in the case of uh, france uh, i uh, we don't have so many so much time so we i'm going really only to 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 explain you some some issues uh, how can i Oh, that's um, space. It's a space? No. No, uh, no this is mine. Yeah, yeah, sure, but I mean just want to show you. No. Just no, no, no. no. down. The arrow down. The arrow. Just the middle. No. Yeah. Doesn't work. Wait. Okay, so just push. Ah, oh, it's only the. Okay, thank you. Uh, to begin with, um, you, this first slide, you can see the, there was um, uh, there have been important emission reductions in energy intensive sectors in France since uh, 1990s and since uh, 2005. In fact, they, are, they, they were more significant in France than in the average of the uh, European Union. Um, as you can see, uh, in the steel sector, you can find um, quite important uh, reduction levels if you compare with uh, Europe, also in non-ferrous metals, uh, also in cement, in cement and in chemical, we, find, we found um, there is a... Um, um, well, the emissions, the, re, the emission reduction in Europe was bigger than in France. In the case, if you compare uh, 1990s uh, versus uh, 2019. Um, but the question here is, uh, despite all these valuable developments, um, we cannot escape that the, this uh, reduction uh, percentage um, is due not only uh, to political uh, with political measures, not only because uh, the development of the carbonization, it was also because the the localization of uh, industries uh, in the different uh, energy intensive sectors. Um, only as an example, you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, iron and in iron and steel sector, for example, for example, you, you may know uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, the main player uh, in the world, um, was reducing significantly uh, his uh, footprint in Europe, of course, in also in France. In non-ferrous metal sector, for example, there, were, there was a regression of the activities of the plants making, uh, for example, aluminium. Uh, the, the main players of aluminium were delocalizing activities uh, outside Europe, um, in different countries, different regions of the, um, of the world. Uh, and for example, Ferroglove, it's an actor very intensive in silicium and magnes activities, magnes production. 
uh, ha has announced uh, its intention to, to close two factories in, in France recently. In cement sector, for example, the, the merger of Holcim and Lafarge um, was um, in some way uh, was a, a signal to, to well, was the beginning of the of the end of some factories and cement, plastic, uh, uh, plastic, plaster, lime uh, activities uh, that uh, they closed closed because of the merger. Uh, you, you can see here the evolution of the employment. Uh, these figures uh, should be taken with uh, caution because uh, they, they provide the evolution of the activities. But uh, as you can see, well, uh, uh, there are different sources. We choose the sources most uh, reliable, we think, uh, in, um, because more or less we know the sectors and the activities and employment at the factory level, but um, um, it may vary a lot from one country to another if you take into account the um, Eurostat statistics or ESBS. Uh, but you can see the decrease uh, in employment in, in the steel industry, it's in, in pink and in, in green, the green one, the, the green graph uh, represents the, the evolution of the employment in uh, chemical sector. Um, you can see, well, uh, and we know uh, uh, every day we are working in, uh, at factory level and we, we saw a lot, of, um, a lot of plants closing because of these policies uh, from the companies and the, the localizing activities. Um, of course, these figures uh, you, you you should take into account the um, the digitalization process in the industry, the automatization process, the robotization. Um, that these uh, factors decrease, of course, the the amount of employment, but mostly the evolutions in the steel and chemical sector is due to, to the localization of industries. Uh, to have a, um, an idea in, of France in terms of the uh, energy intensive sectors, um, energy intensive se sectors, you can see here a map uh, with the main um, sites um, in the energy intensive sectors in, in, in France, and they are, are from Excelsium Consortium. Uh, I mean, the, the graph. Excelsium Consortium was um, uh, an employer's association uh, uh, who gathers uh, 70, uh, 27 companies. Uh, um, from steel, aluminium, chemicals, industrial gases, paper, um, uh, and with a high electricity cost percentage uh, over its uh, total costs. You can see uh, between 15 and 50 uh, of production costs is due uh, to electricity. Um, there is also another association, Uni, Uniden, who uh, gather more companies uh, uh, from more sectors, and they represent more or less about the 70% of industrial energy consum consumption in France, Uniden. Um, there are two associations um, also because there, there was, um, well, there is a legal protection in France for energy intensive sector for companies. It's a, um, a special status for these companies who provides uh, benefits in terms of uh, taxation, in terms of fiscal, um, in terms of, of uh, fiscal aids, uh, public aids. Um, and there are two specific sta status, uh, electro-intensive uh, industries and hyper-electro-intensive uh, industries. 
more or less exceldium represents uh, hyper electro intensive se sector um, industries although there are also electro intensive industries in exceldium and uni then represents uh, more or less the total amount of companies who who are um, protected by the, um, the this uh, this uh, legal uh, um, this law uh, uh, in France and the criteria to define what is an electro intensive industry or hyper electro intensive industry uh, it's uh, based on three elements ratio between annual electricity consumption um, divided by value added uh, of the production exposure of this company to international uh, trade international market and uh, electricity consumption um, um, the question is uh, more or less the, there were um, a, a study from the government um addressing all the companies who ha who um, could be included in, in this uh, special status and more in, in 2010 so it's quite a long time ago and there was like a 500 uh, companies in france uh, who could be considered uh, like that not companies who are asked for protection it's a, a study to more or less to quantify how many companies could be. At national level, uh, the most important document is uh, the national low carbon strategy. Um, I don't, I, we don't have so many times, so I, I will, but the national low carbon strategy is um, more or less the, the, the law, the, program of the government setting the frame to to decarbonize activities in france uh, but the most important is the second paragraph um, because uh, up, um, after that after after the national low carbon strategy uh, there was the implementation um, previous consultation to uh, trade unions um, mostly um, mostly to to employers associations to design the roadmaps for decarbonization at sectoral level, at industry level. And there were um, three roadmaps, um, mining and metallurgy, uh, cement sector, and um, chemical sector. You can see here uh, the uh, reductions in, in million tons of um, CO2 equivalent um, for a steel sector, aluminum sector, chemical sector, and cement sector. Um, um, the roadmaps are quite interesting uh, documents uh, because they gather, well, they describe uh, the process to decarbonize by technology, by type of production, um, in um, within each sector because uh, as you may know um, there is uh, plenty of difference uh, for example to produce a steel if you choose a blast furnace um, path or electrical path it's quite it's totally different it's technology totally different the impacts uh, of um, electrification uh, of um, uh, recycling um, of uh, substitution of materials and so on it's quite different um, and they are quite interesting and they design more or less um, um, you can see uh, the evolution of the by uh, seeing these uh, roadmaps you can see the evolution of um, each sector uh, by 2030 and 2050 and also they in some cases they divided the technologies between mature technologies or less mature technologies and they made assumptions um, 
you can see well you you can see the full report uh, after but it's quite in, uh, interesting information but it has some um, some problems for example in this case in the roadmaps they are like um, a box to put all pro all the projects of the companies without the global vision without um, a coordination and perhaps you i felt this i had the feeling uh, reading the documents and uh, watching the technologies and so on that could be uh, more synergies between companies could be hubs of design of um, and there is um, a lack of this kind of uh, conception the roadmaps are like um, um you know a description of all the projects uh, um, carrying out uh, in the country by by sector and by technology but um, and there is um, a lack of visibility of uh, of feasibility also because some technologies they describe very well and their assumptions but they you cannot see how they are going to do it okay two minutes actually just say something on that. okay um but i only to see to uh, you, this is the most important i think document the roadmaps for to to see how france is evolu um, how is the, the evolution but um other important things is because of the COVID, there were implementation of you know uh, of policies to relaunch the economy and this, all these policies of the government take uh, into account um, in a very strong way the, the decarbonization of the activities there were the there were launches of uh, uh, public aids normally co-financing co projects normally is the co-financing co of the projects but also public aids without um, without the um, because the co co the co-financing of the projects is uh, in terms of percentage of the project it depends on the importance it depends on of the critical uh, um, presence of the company in this sector, so on. Um, you can see here more or less a map of um, all the projects carried out, just to just to um, to because of these uh, uh, programs launched uh, by the COVID pandemic. Um, and, but now, um, as you can, as you may know, France is going further. Um, is going um, to a, a better point, um, accelerating uh, the decarbonization uh, thanks to uh, the France 2030 plan announced by the president uh, last uh, December, November, the end of November. And that means uh, new uh, measures, new public ads, um, reaching five billion uh, euros to induce specific to industrial sectors, and they um, they launch also uh, they publish two documents, two important documents, the beginning of a, a new strategy. And it's the one, the first document is acceleration on a strategy on decarbonization of the industry to accelerate, uh, well, it's um, um, to, um, to accelerate really the decarbonization through public ads. And there's a, a specific plan inside the metallurgy sector, a specific plan for the steel industry with three axes. Um, very ambitious one but interesting um uh, apart from cbm they propose carbon contracts for differences to for difference uh, the germans uh, spoke about it and mm, more ambitious uh, um, measures only to to one one two minutes uh, to to end uh, one 
my my colleague is going to 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 speak more about jobs but in terms of jobs uh, we were um, um, we were making research about uh, all the ads all the programs of the government the impact on the uh, at industry level and one interesting program is the transco transco scheme it's a program mm, recently launched uh, last year uh, mm, in january 2021 and um, it has two components this uh, mm, transco scheme um, basically uh, enables the employers to the the, um, the workers to to undergo um, a retraining um, a retraining program during up to uh, 24 months uh, but having access has access at the same time uh, uh, to to money okay it's a program called financing between uh, companies and uh, mainly for the government to a maximum of two uh, smic it's interesting because at the end of the program, the worker um, it's um, re uh, a skill. Um, it's it ha uh, it has received a training to re, re skill and upskill his abilities and competencies, and he may op uh, he may have the option uh, to uh, return to to his or her job previous job. In an, in an equivalent position or um, different position, or to move to a new sector because uh, the worker has the possibility to retrain and reskill in different sector or different activity or department that uh, he was working. And uh, for the moment, in one year of this uh, program, there were interesting results in terms at, at uh, plant level. There were interesting results. So that's all because we don't have so yeah. many time. So uh, uh, thank you, Jose, uh, thank uh, you. very much. And uh, we will come back, of course, with questions. Uh, interesting case, uh, uh, past uh, employment losses, uh, delocalization, active industrial and labor market policies, uh, and uh, very ambitious decarbonization plan. So it's an interesting combination. Uh, so. Um, Next, uh, uh, we will uh, follow the case of uh, Spain, um, uh, presented by uh, Raquel Barreiros from Syndex Spain office. And uh, after uh, uh, Raquel, it's uh, the word is yours, and uh, possibly, uh, well, maximum 20 minutes uh, is. You can do that, and then we will still have some time to discuss both. So please. Okay. Good morning. It's it's okay. The song. Yes. Uh, first, I would like to to thank to the European Trade Union Institute for the opportunity to participate in in this project and for organizing this this workshop. I'm Raquel Barreiros, I'm representing Syndex Consultores Iberica the subsidiary in Spain of Ops Index. I will present the, um, the Spanish case under the, the following title, Energy Intensive Industries in Spain on the Carbonization Path. What does this mean for you? The first section of this presentation consists of presenting the Spanish electro-intensive industry, its employment data, and the most relevant challenges and pathways of decarbonization. <clears throat> One second. The, um, in December 20, 2020, a royal decree regulating the electrointensive consumers statute was approved in Spain. And this statute defines the concept of electrointensive in Spain. Uh, stipulate the requirements to be an electrointensive consumer, and also the obligation commitment um, support insurance uh, su support mechanisms to which they can apply. The companies that meet uh, this criteria in Spain belong to the iron and steel 
chemical, semen, and non ferrous metal sector. Um, <clears throat> mapping the electrointensive industry in Spain, it can be seen that they predominate uh, in the north in the northern coastal area of the peninsula. Uh, that the sector with the most companies are cement and chemistry, and that the steel sector uh, has a greater number of production plants. <clears throat> in these four sectors, the employment figures are different. In the steel, the chemical, um, the aluminum sector, the employment trend is stable, but the the data is different. The aluminum sector employs around 10,000 of people. The steel sector employed around 22,000. And the chemical sector, uh, around 200,000 people. But the cement sector suffered, in, suffered from the impact of the um, 2008 financial crisis on construction in Spain. Both production and employment have fallen by half. And also a slight recovery can be seen starting in 2014 and seems to be continuing. <clears throat> Progress in emission reductions is also very different between sectors. In the European Union, there is no allocation of emission reduction tangent between member states or sectors. Thus, Spain followed the European emission reduction tangent um, has only one target of its own. By 2030, to reduce 23% 20, compared to 1990. Um, <clears throat> as there are no distribution between sectors, a reduction in some uh, sector can compensate for increases or non-reduction in others, but it also involves very um, ambiguous margin that uh, may mean the collective um, target will not be met in the end. As can be seen in the in the table, the steel sector and the cement sector, compared to 1990 in Spain. Uh, reduces the, the emissions, but <clears throat> the chemical and non-ferrous metal sector even increased their, their emissions. In the decarbonization process, the Spanish electrointensive industries uh, faces two main challenges. The national energy mix and the path towards renewable energies and the regional concentration of polluting activities. Despite the advantages in renewable in Spain and its favorable geographic for their development, the green energy, as can be seen in the, in the table here, uh, the green energy used in the electrointensive industry is practically insignificant. And on the other hand, in a country as regionalized as Spain, it cannot ignore the fact that the um, impact of an energy transition will be particularly significant in areas dependent on pollution sector, which have no other economic or industrial resources, so which will have to be offered accompanying measures. Um, in the short term, in the short term, Spanish electrointensive industries are mainly committed uh, to the circular economy. The document España Circular 2030 leads to the foundation for promoting a new model of circular production and consumption. The most relevant targets uh, for electrointensive sectors by 2030 are to reduce in 30% the national consumption of materials in relation to GDP, and to reduce uh, of waste generation by 15%, and to increase reuse and preparation for reuse by 10% of municipal waste generated. 
And in the long term, the sector favor, favor the development of hydrogen as the main vector for new decarbonized production processes. The, um, <clears throat> the hydrogen roadmap in Spain focuses on green hydrogen as a fundamental and transversal tool for decarbonization um, in Spain. The, um, the objectives in Spain about the, the green hydrogen are very ambitious. Um, with the intention of turning the Spain into an exporter during the, 2030, the 2040s. Um, in addition, in December 2020, the, um, in, Spain, in Spain, the PERTE of uh, renewable energies, renewable hydrogen and storage was approved. PERTE is the Spanish acronym of um, a strategic project for economy recovery and transformation. And it's a new instrument for public and private collaboration with the aim of promoting major initiatives that contribute to the transformation of the Spanish economy after the pandemic. And this PERTE aims to generate more than 200 18,000 jobs in renewable sector with green hydrogen uh, being one of the most important points. The second section of this uh, presentation focuses on employment. The <clears throat> Spanish government's forecast are quite ambitious. Uh, in one of its official document, it's point out that um, the energy transition and decarbonization present great opportunities for the industrial sector, and that if the necessary accompanying measures are taken, there need not be a negative impact on employment. From the point of view of workers, the just transition must be um, as the government Spanish uh, says, must be built enabling um, them to adapt, adapt their competencies and skills to new markets, uh, to new markets demand through active labor market policies. And from the point of view of companies and public administration, adapt this business culture to the principles of corporate social responsibility and guaranteeing health and safety condition in workplaces affected by the, by the change. According to another Spanish government document, the proposed measures will generate a net increase in employment of between 253,000 and 348,000 people per year. However, these forecasts are generic. So there is no official analysis in Spain of the impact on employment of electro-intensive industries as a quantitative level. Um, the quantitative impact uh, is uncertain. Uh, a current example that we at, at Syndex are aware of is of a company that expects to lose 1,000 of its 5,000 jobs by switching from blast furnace to electric arc furnace in the medium term. For the time being, the, um, the priority is given to projects related to studying industrial uh, investment or technical issues uh, without taking into account the, um, the social issues. Um, on the contrary, with regards to the impact of decarbonization on employment tasks, skills, and jobs profiles, there is a widespread consensus of se on several facts. One, the transition holds the potential to retain the existing workforce, but a brutal ration in the manufacturing processes may affect employment, most of the cases in remote areas affecting mainly workers. The second, the transition will require a major and sustained relocation of labor across sector, occupation in regions, as well as significant 
investment in re and up skilling, retention of existing workers, and attracting new workers. The thirdly, skills development will be a particularly important challenge as new capacity will be necessary, mainly in digitalization, innovation, internalization, resilience, etc. Um, high demand is forecast for engineers, specialists, um, business professionals who have emerging technology expertise. Um, finally, new job, new job opportunities can be expected in design, innovation, um, innovation and product development, disassembling, remanufacturing, repair, etc. For all this in time, uh, for all these reasons, <laughs> at, at Syndes, we are putting the emphasis on qualitative analysis. Uh, and to conclude, I will give an example of methodology to be implemented to mitigate the potential negative impacts of the decarbonization transition. It consists in four steps. The first, identification of the actual jobs on end of the actual skills. The second, identification of tomorrow jobs and their related required skills. Thirdly, building career paths between today's and tomorrow jobs. And finally, identif identifying pathways that will lead to define the needs for successful transition, successful mobility, and successful up or and rescaling. These four steps should be done collectively by all the potential stakeholders, uh, like um, workers, uh, um, human resources, uh, the worker representatives, etc. The first stage is to detail all the existing jobs in the company or sector. These rules uh, may allow jobs to be grouped into broader families, contain several jobs, which may be broken down into subfamilies. With this grouping, it will be possible to identify the trends to which the job are exposed. For example, intention when requiring strategic and rare skills. Undergoing transformation where the work uh, content or methods require new skills. Emerging or growing, growing where requiring the creation of new jobs in the short or medium term, in decline or stable. <clears throat> The second stage is an analysis, analysis of the company's strategy in the mid and long term to determine the volumes of jobs requires, requires and needs and the needs in terms of skill, knowledge, or know-how. The, um, the three step aims to identify the bridge between today's jobs and those of tomorrow. And the most traditional method is to identify jobs that are professionally close and to define the feasibility of functional mobility between these two jobs. And the final step is uh, of this example of methodology is to identify pathways that will lead to define the need for successful transition mobility, re and up skilling. Uh, the vocational training the public aid or for upskilling or reskilling and the public aid for geographical mobility, the securing career paths and regular monitoring and follow up of, of upskilling and reskilling programs to ensure their success and to develop efficient mechanism. So what can be concluded that um, is that there is clearly is still a long way to go, but um, I don't know what to finish without mentioning that hopefully the recent announcement in February, in final of the February 2022 of the possible easing of a national PERTE for electro intensive uh, industries can provide uh, an answer to these challenges, um, more especially for the social issue. Um, 
it's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Raquel. Uh, very interesting. And uh, also uh, interesting how important the national uh, uh, recovery and resilience uh, the plan, uh, uh, NRFP, uh, uh, is uh, uh, for the case of Spain. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we saw then two countries that uh, had some employment loss in the past, differential, have strong uh, public uh, policies, support measures for these industries. So on top of the European ones, they have national support uh, uh, system and uh, well, uh, active labor market policies. So uh, let's see, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes probably maximum for questions and answers. So any of you, um, a question on France and or Spain? Oh yes, uh, I see one already, so then please. Uh. Uh, I have a question on France. Uh, could you elaborate on the expected impact uh, on the labor market of the national strategy, uh, the, the low carbon strategy, I think? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, the two uh, presentations. Uh, two quick uh, questions. Uh, the first one um, is to, to ask you whether uh, what um, governments uh, and different roadmaps uh, Excuse see me? where. And could you uh, is is matching or not with what you can see on the ground in the different sites uh, where you have contact with with trade unions? Uh, and my second question has to do with uh, electricity production. I think that in both countries, uh, direct electri electrification and uh, clean hydrogen uh, uh, will be will be two uh, important uh, channels to decarbonize energy intensive industries. Hence, uh, the importance to um, increase uh, electricity generation capacities uh, and, and keep it at an affordable price. Uh, you, you mentioned the series of, of mechanisms for, for friends. I was also wondering whether those mechanisms would exist or not in, in Spain. Uh, we know that Spain uh, has been kind of uh, at the front line uh, regarding uh, the increase of uh, energy prices in, in Europe how um, those two countries will, will ensure that there will be enough uh, clean electricity in the future and clean electricity at an affordable price for energy intensive industries. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, let me take one more uh, from the floor, uh, please. Oops, okay, Oleg. Uh... Thank you. Um, I. Uh have in mind that uh, Spain, the Spanish grid has parted from the French electricity mm -hmm. grid with which it was interconnected mm -hmm. recently about two weeks ago, something like that. So the flows were not, are not going to come and go. Uh, that means that Spain will have to rely on its own sources, whether domestic or uh, coming from elsewhere. Now, I saw by uh, what you have introduced here as, a, as the main industrial situation in Spain that um, industry is in the north, but all the renewables are in the south, sun and all that. And it's huge in Spain, it's very strong. Solar panels, <coughs> connected of course, to the north, through the grid, and through a lot of storage systems, which I will not expand on here because you probably know them already. That is a source of job creating. The maintenance, the maintenance of the uh, interconnectivity, the maintenance of the, uh, the storage cap capabilities, and the uh, maintenance of each side of the um, uh, the path from source to consumer. 
everybody has some kind of um, responsibility in having highly skilled jobs produced there on, on both sides and in, in the middle. That's one possibility. And uh, the other was um, about um, the importance as, of, of having clean producing plants, filtering anything that comes out that can be filtered, either that would go as waste to water, which would be a terrible conclusion of the proceedings, or to air, another terrible conclusion of the proceedings. That is very important and can be done in, in the courtyard. In every single uh, factory has to be responsible of that spot filtering and cleaning and and just as we do when we um, select our uh, municipal garbage in different sacks, covered covered sacks. That's yeah. another job creating, mm -hmm. very important, and that has to do with responsibility and accountability and can be controlled and inspected. Uh, there would be more, yeah, but, but uh, I think that uh, you uh, you will expand lately. Thank you very much for Thank keeping it short. Uh, 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 we are running out of time. So uh, I don't know, like, if you wanted that quick one. There will be time. I will ask my question if there's time left. Well, I think uh, we have two from the uh, online uh, audience that I would just add. You already have quite a list here, yeah, but, uh, but uh, two uh, quite concrete ones. Uh, the one is uh, the role of European Works Councils. Uh, uh, if you could say a few words uh, in the uh, decarbonization of these uh, enterprises, uh, do they provide themselves with their uh, room uh, there? Uh, that was one, and one, there was one concrete question on France on the Transco scheme. Uh, how many industry workers uh, have taken this opportunity until now? If you can say something on that. Uh, so that's that's all, yeah. Uh, 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 so if you could uh, reflect on on these questions, uh, yeah, in an, uh, a rather short way. Um, okay. The first question: What? Uh, how? Uh, what's it? Oh, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the first question of uh, how is your name? Your name? Do you, uh, did you ask? Uh, Do you have a set of plants uh, made by governments? Whereas the sites and the plants are owned by private companies. So my question was, is there a machine between the plants and what is... The, the, what the government... What? Ah, at side. Ah, okay. For the first question, um, there there were some assumptions uh, about the impacts, but no, um, there was no a quantification, really a quantification in terms of workers about the impacts of uh, the carbonization, uh, neither in Spain and uh, nor in France. There is no at all from any kind of sources. I mean, like uh, quantification. There, there is what we would like to um, to put the accent is on the uh, at a quali at a um, qualitative way. I mean, the jobs uh, for sure there will be impacts, negative impacts. We we think. We think that, although there were uh, an increase in some employments, but the main point is the um, the how different will be the work, how we, how different will be the competencies, the skills, and so on. And we would like to put the uh, accent on uh, and to be a word about the. Um, uh, the necessity, the need of the companies uh, and the government to retrain really re redesign the programs, the training programs, because we came from a, a totally different uh, kind of approach before. And now, uh, at the same time, the, the industry is changing. It should change the training programs and the training sessions inside the companies. Uh, the first question you said, 
there were quite differences between um, government and companies uh, in France and also in, I think, in Spain to, to design the plans and the type of aids. Uh, of course, the companies are always claiming for much, for much money to, to invest, of course, always. <laughs> But uh, at site level, it will be uh, what well, we can distinguish between the former uh, colleagues uh, said, uh, the impacts on the big companies um, will have more opportunities to make profit from these uh, ads, from these programs. But at uh, SME or PME companies and uh, all the downstream, of the of the industry, it could be difficult to have a very mm, a proper impact at the same level at the big companies. So we are um, worried about this uh, mm, about how to design or how to help to design uh, proper mechanisms to uh, spread all the opportunities for all type of companies at site level. Um, more questions. Uh, one of uh, 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 you you made another question. Uh, electricity. Oh yeah, electricity generation. Well, yeah, and it matches with the question of the the other colleague. Um, electricity generation in France there um, well there is a huge discussion as you may know to how to declare the nuclear power this is under for example in Spain the approach is like nuclear power is not renewable at all and um, in Spain the the, um, the social sentiment and the social um, posture is to reject all kind of, no, actually in all the uh, nuclear power plants in Spain are closing or are, um, it has a term to, to close. Not, it's not the case in France. And last uh, France plan 2030, it launched um, this new type of nuclear uh, power central, uh, more, um, a smaller one with a different technology, cleaner and safer, and they are going to 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 develop this um, via. Um, uh, actually, uh, we make ass assumptions to um, um, about the need of electricity uh, to develop all kind of technologies and also the automotive sector and um, for the moment it's um, quite difficult to imagine um, a totally decarbonized electricity generation um, i think in europe it's difficult to like totally uh, imagine a totally decarbonized electricity without the help of uh, nuclear in some specific ways or or whatever it's difficult but in in france and um, mostly in spain there is a good um, development of uh, um, uh, electricity generation by renewables not only in the south there is also in the coast in the east coast and in the north also uh, in the north there are some like wind power uh, but um, not so much um, uh, uh, not so much photovoltaic of course in the north but really in the north uh, uh, if you started to go down from the really north um, you you can find very very soon uh, photovoltaic uh, farms also in in spain there now there is a really uh, uh, development and yes we depend on sometimes on france uh, exchange of energy but uh, the government is exploring uh, to develop uh, hydrogen 
and to develop to more develop uh, wind and 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 sun sun and and solar solar elect, uh, renewable electricity and jobs the maintenance of these facilities we, uh, we don't for uh, we don't see that we don't foresee uh, so much evolution in terms of, of employment on maintenance because maintenance uh, you create the the renewable is, is installations and then uh, and you had you need you need workers to do that but not so many workers to to the maintenance of the installations it's not so big it actually is really small the percentage of workers it, it is important but it's uh, you, um, uh, we cannot uh, expect that all these activities absorb all the employment uh, all the employment lose because of the delocalization or automatization or digitalization i mean uh, we need to ensure uh, um, activities more in terms of production or um, um, in different parts of the chain of, of the value chain, more than in maintenance. In maintenance, of course, but um, not only. You know. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you were covering uh, a lot, and also partially Spain as well. But Rachel, please. Yes. Well, we, uh, if yes, uh, you uh, add, yes. uh, probably yeah. short. Yes. Just um, just just to complement uh, uh, the employment per megawatt you of renewable energy uh, is higher, but um, the problem in Spain um, is that there are many rural, there are many rural areas that depend on polluting activities. Um, therefore, uh, the gross loss in these rural areas is, um, is total. But um, for this, for this reason, just transition mechanisms are uh, developing and um are um, need to be developed uh, even more in order to to be able to make displacement uh, between regions uh, and sectors um in relation to electrification um in spain is necessary um a, struct a structural uh, change in the um, electricity market because um the the price is higher a lot higher and i think it's data for for this met in the in the in the in the final research yes um, uh, and there are there are strategic plans of the government to change this but uh, in 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 our opinion uh, these um, these strategic plans are very ambitious so i i think that i i have to wait to the to the to the future to to look at is it possible or not possible to this uh, one last compliment yeah. if it's possible and if yeah. you say one word on the ewc uh, oh yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Sure. ewc yeah. i i forgot it i have a and bad then, memory a really bad memory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um in terms of electricity also yes there are you ask for i remember that you ask for um uh, mechanisms in Spain, or uh, there are mechanisms like the interrumpibility of the uh, uh, of the installations. It's like um, um, a kind of uh, packages of electricity that, uh, in case of the plants who consume a lot of electricity, in the cases they are stop or um, they produce at uh, low level they exchange electricity with the government they put electricity in the grid to 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 distribute in a different way and they receive uh, or they pay less money for for uh, uh, for the uh, electricity price there are mechanisms um, this mechanism is very well developed in france this interrumpibility mechanism and uh, in Spain, there are also these mechanisms, uh, but uh, the problem is uh, the, the electricity. They are not in Spain, for example, the price is higher because they are not like consortiums, cons consortiums like in France, for example, in with Excel, uh, Exceltium, to um, buy electricity packages for 
he half of um, companies or um, a lot of companies together uh, we, uh, who buy electricity at lower price price and in long term. In Spain, there there are um, there is no this possibility. The uh, electricity companies. Um, doesn't offer, uh, don't offer this opportunity. In uh, um, about EWC, what is the role in this? If there is an rock and in, in, in the decarbonization process and managing the, the strength. I've, I think so, I think so, of course, because um, uh, as you can see, as you can, as you may know, the uh, at European level, the EWC can't discuss about the uh, salary about the, they can discuss about the, uh, what is called soft law, um, social aspects of the company and to be informed uh, about the, the evolution of the results of the companies. And I think they, they could uh, uh, put pressure on the, on the um, directions of, on the management to design paths to design to to put the focus uh, on, on the decarbonization process. I mean, it's a, a climate uh, um, a climate issue, and they could uh, ask for the company, and they could uh, ask responsibility to the management because of the C, uh, CSR documents yeah. they publish. So yeah. they could do uh, a work yeah. in, the, in this sense. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you really uh, for the good discussion and the presentations. Uh, we are a little bit over the time, but uh, we are just going into the lunch break and we still start again at 1.30 as according to the plan. So a little bit shorter lunch break, but uh, 1.30, uh, we continue, uh, we will have the UK, we will have Italy, and then we will have a policy debate. So thank you. So Maria, can we? Yeah. Okay, so uh, good afternoon uh, again. So we continue and uh, after we had uh, interesting inputs and uh, debates on, on Germany, Europe, uh, Poland, France and Spain, uh, now we are uh, coming to the UK uh, report uh, of this uh, study. Uh, and uh, I will just um, give the floor uh, online uh, to Vera Trapman, uh, Joe Cutter, uh, 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 and yes, um, so uh, Ursula Boulders. Uh, so uh, all together, unfortunately, we have only like 20 minutes. Uh, so let's see exactly. Yeah, well, yes, 20 minutes. Yeah. So if you can um, wrap up uh, in, in, in uh, roughly 20 minutes, yeah, would be great. Uh, and uh, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bella. Yeah, so um, my name is Vera Trapman, and I'm a professor of comparative employment relations at the University of Leeds. And originally, we were planning that at least one of us could be there in person. That was uh, Ursula. So um, unfortunately, we are all now hybrid. But nevertheless, thanks for enabling this opportunity. Um, the presentation we developed is on uh, steel, glass and cement, which we chose as our case studies for the foundation industries, uh, which have some commonalities to the cases we heard about in other European countries. But there are some specific UK uh, specifics and um, I'm handing um, over to my colleague uh, Ursula, who is going to do the presentation. Um, but before uh, saying hello to Joe as well, who joins us um, as a co-author for this paper. Jo Ursula, please. Um, okay, great. I'll just share my screen. Um, mm. 
Right, yeah, hello everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, industrial decarbonisation plans in the UK and their implications for workers in the foundation industries. Um, so yeah, this work was put together by um, me and my colleagues at Leeds University. Um, and yeah, so the foundation industries is the term used to describe a particular group of energy intensive industries, the ones listed below. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, in the two decades up to 2016, um, UK foundation industry's share of GDP shrank by 43%. Uh, this is compared to an average of um, OECD decline of around 21%. Uh, so the UK foundation industries are quite fragile. Um, they emit a lot of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, as the table shows. Uh, there's quite a lot of variation within and across the sectors, uh, with iron and steel producing far more emissions than ceramics from people employed in these industries is quite variable as well, uh, ranging from 46,000 in the chemical sector to 2,500 in cement. Uh, some of these industries, uh, the job numbers have, main, have uh, remained steady uh, since 2014. Uh, others have declined. That's indicated by the arrow shown in the table. Um, yeah, all of them have been on a, a decline in, in terms of uh, when a longer trajectory of time is considered. So uh, the research methodology for this piece of work was um, we reviewed relevant policy documents. Uh, we conducted a series of interviews with foundation industry stakeholders. And as Vera already mentioned, we focused on three of the six foundation industries, steel, cement and glass. And we spoke to a number of skills experts as well. So um, UK uh, decarbonisation targets are uh, ambitious. In 2019, the UK became the first major economy to commit to net zero by 2050. Um, in, uh, since then, in April and December, uh, interim targets have been uh, also released to ensure that hopefully the country stays on goal to meet its net zero. Um, that zero by 2050 target, um, but these these are ambitious and um, they a continual evolution is posing a number of challenges for industry who have to kind of update their roadmaps, their decarbonisation roadmaps, uh, show how they're going to be able to meet the targets required. Um, so UK decarbonisation strategies most relevant to the foundation industries are plans to decarbonise electricity production by 2035. Um, that's the plan, whether or not we're on track for that, I don't think we are, so I'll mention uh, a little bit later. Um, as, as other presenters have mentioned, there's plans to scale up hydrogen produ production and de develop delivery networks. Uh, in the UK, the plans are for this mainly to be blue hydrogen, so uh, hydrogen made from methane and oil refineries, and then split into carbon dioxide um, and uh, the hydrogen itself, and then the development of carbon capture and storage technology, which, as you all know, is pipelines that deliver uh, carbon dioxide emissions into, um, well, in the case of the UK, empty oil and gas reservoirs uh, that are under the North Sea. These plans are quite advanced in the UK, um, and the carbon capture networks will also uh, deliver the uh, additional CO2 emissions that are produced from the produ production of hydrogen. Um, so I think probably a key point to note in terms of the UK's decarbonisation strategy, industrial decarbonisation strategy, is that very little funding has been made available. So plans for reaching net zero were initially outlined in uh, the 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution. This made no specific mention of plans for the foundation industries, although it did refer to carbon capture usage and storage, often referred to just as carbon capture and storage these days, um, and the plans to develop uh, or super places, which is where carbon capture and storage, carbon capture usage and storage and hydrogen networks would be rolled out together. And the decarbonisation plans, rather than allocate allocate government funding directly. Um, policy documents rely primarily on the phase, phrase, um, start to mobilize public and private investment for green industries. So there's not that much money coming up front from the government, but rather the assumption is uh, that the uh, the money will come from the private, and that has been the plans to decarbonise industry, meet the needs of, the, of, of, of specific se sections of the private sector, namely fossil, some of the uh, fossil fuel infrastructure companies, as more than they do the foundation industries. Um, because as I've already noticed, they are quite fragile in the UK. So um, 
yeah, the, these, these plans for super places have evolved into um, the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge Fund, which is funding the planning, but not the actual rollout of the decarbonisation pro projects. Um, so very little money is being made specifically to help foundation industries decarbonise and certainly nowhere near the amount of money that's actually needed. So, for example, for steel, um, uh, sort of uh, 25 million or... Uh, sorry, uh, 0.25 billion has been made available by the Clean um, Steel Fund. However, um, this money will not be allocated to specific projects in 2023, um, despite a num number of years ago, um, uh, whereas estimates suggest that around 2.8 billion to 3.5 billion is of capital expenditure is needed to decarbonise the UK steel industry. Um, and this, um, these, this, this volume of money is just unaffordable for most UK producers, given their weak financial situation. Um, one exception is uh, a, small, a small, fairly small initiative that's worth mentioning, which is um, from the UK Research and Innovation Body, which launched Foundation Industries Challenge, and this supports short-term projects aimed at supporting innovation in the foundation industries. So, for example, a trial fuel switching projects. So I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about these um, cluster decarbonisation plans. Um, uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, uh, the UK has six um, industrial clusters. Industrial clusters are uh, geographically located groups of interlinked industries, uh, where you have very high levels of emissions across relatively small geographic areas. So the plan is to decarbonise rather than specific industries, um, specific locations. And the two places which have received, um, or the two clusters which are going to go ahead first, are one term, the HiNet project, which will capture emissions from uh, Merseyside in the northwest, um, and then a, a joint initiative between Teesside and, hum, uh, Teesside and Humberside, which is called the East Coast Cluster, and will capture emissions. In these projects, you'll have hydrogen production and carbon capture and storage rolled out together, and then um, these sites have been chosen because of the easy access to uh, storage of carbon dioxide and disused uh, oil and gas wells in the North, in the North Sea. Um, so that's all well and good, but this, these plans don't really meet the needs of the UK um, foundation industries. Um, and, and that means that the foundation industries are, um, sorry, uh, yeah, so there's a number of, of challenges uh, that the foundation industries are, are, are facing. Um, so uh, most of the foundation industries are located outside uh, these industrial clusters. So the, these um, maps show uh, the location of um, uh, the planned industrial clusters and then uh, the steel manufacturing, cement and glass manufacturing sites. So uh, one we've got the UK's large glass manufacturing sites, one of which would receive access to um, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage via these new industrial cluster projects. The other won't, neither will the smaller uh, electric arc furnace sites around uh, Sheffield. Uh, in terms of cement manufacturing, only one of our 10 cement manufacturing sites is within the remit of an industrial cluster project. Um, and with the case of glass, uh, there's two there's two glass manufacturing sites out of I think about uh, 16, 17, uh, which uh, receive access to hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. So these projects, these in, the, the government's industrial decarbonisation plans aren't necessarily going to meet foundation industry needs. So another challenge to decarbonisation, um, foundation industry decarbonisation in the UK is the very high electricity prices. So I know that's come up um, previously as well. Um, uh, but so, as I was saying, most of the UK foundation industries are located outside industrial clusters, and that means um, electrification is likely to play an important role in the technology changes at these sites. Um, but a significant barrier to the adoption of, uh, for example, electrified furnaces is the cost of electricity in the UK. Um, it's currently three times more expensive than gas. Um, and the fact that UK producers pay uh, 50 to 60 percent more for energy than their main competitors. In 2021, the average UK electricity um, prices paid by steel companies was double those um, what was uh, paid by steel companies was double compared to those in Germany. Um, also, switching to glass and steel glass and steel to electricity alone would would require an additional 5.2 gigawatts gigawatts of power. And as the plans are currently to scale up offshore wind by 40 gigawatts, this is nowhere near sufficient to meet projected demands. 
given that this 40 gigawatt is intended to decarbonize um, uh, electricity, provide in additional electricity for transport, uh, heating, uh, as well as uh, industry itself. So um, yeah, it, it, things are not looking so hopeful from in, for, from UK perspective. And the way in which policy is responding to the needs of decarbonisation, despite these high level rhetorical commitments, which have been made, such as, you know, we were one of the first large economies to commit to net zero. Um, so uh, a third point I'd like to raise is that UK legislation does not really support uh, a circular economy. Um, decarbonisation. So um, the UK produces a lot of scrap steel, but 7.3 million tonnes out of um, 10 million tonnes a year of this is exported rather than recycled domestically. Another example is the government is unwilling to invest in the technologies needed to transition to a circular economy for steel, such as electric arc furnaces and advanced scrap grading technologies. There's no incentive for construction companies to reduce cement use, lower use lower carbon cement blends and or reclaim cement bars following demolition. And then policies to help this. It's currently very cheap uh, to displace sorry, a glass sorry. plant. We have, bit, only uh, we have a sound problem. Uh, if you could speak up a little bit or or get nearer to the mic, it would help a little bit. Okay, yeah, I can speak a bit. Is that is that better? Probably a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, as I was saying, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of UK legislation doesn't support foundation and um, uh, circular economy approaches to decarbonisation. Um, also, going back to a point that I mentioned at the start was um, this aspect of skills in the foundation industry. So, um, given the lack of investment, the future of foundation industry businesses is, is uncertain, and this is reducing their ability to attract talent and making training workers more difficult. Um, so of course struggle to attract sufficient students to run. This is compounded by competition for STEM graduates, with many preferring, preferring high paid data analysis jobs in big cities to work in industries which are perceived as, um, uh, as dirty in smaller or less glamorous towns. Um, UK foundation industries suffer from an aging workforce. Um, a quarter of businesses reported that more than half their employees are over 50, with them um, 41 and 30 cement glass businesses respectively, reporting that they had no employees at all under 25. Um, so um, this means that many foundation industry businesses are not focused on developing the skills required to maintain competitiveness in a net zero economy, but rather they're trying to combat more immediate problems of an aging workforce and the associated, associated loss of technical knowledge. The only long-term skill strategizing being done um, uh, in the foundation industry is being driven by unions in the steel sector and not by government businesses or unions representing glass or cement sector workers. This is possibly because steel sector workers in the UK have a dedicated union, whereas glass and cement workers are distributed across a number of different union bodies. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, as I was Sorry, um, as I was saying this, um, uh, that, just, that slide shouldn't be there. Um, excuse me. What's, I don't know what's happened. I just somehow it skipped to the end. One second. Um, uh, mm. Yeah, sorry, as I was saying, um, uh, across a number of different bodies. Um, another thing that came out of our research is quite interesting is that um, uh, foundation industry um, uh, workers are not being consulted about decarbonisation plans and feel quite uninformed and disconnected from net zero goals. So here's just some, just a few quotes. Um, so um, no, it's not widely broadcast in the workplace what the company are doing or anything. Uh, they have it on their own internet site, but very few people go to look at that site at all. Your managers are more likely to look than the shop floor workers. Um, that was from a trade union uh, a representative in Glass. I don't think they, the shop floor workers, are up to date and as aware of things that are happening as we union reps are. Uh, we've been briefed uh, a bit, but um, previously I wasn't aware. I knew damage occurring generally in relation 
do what is in the news, but no, I don't think that information is communicated enough for people. And that was a rep in cement. And then another rep in cement, I know we burn alternative fuels, but I don't think they, the workers, know much more because it doesn't really affect their daily work. Obviously, it does. Um, it, it does for management. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so this sort of uh, echoes some of the findings of our some of our um, other piece, another piece of our research, which found that workers are kind of ready to be ready to transition, but they're finding it quite hard to access the support and skills that they need to do so. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting area for future research, I think. Um, so finally, coming back to the implications for jobs and skills in the foundation industries, um, there are num numerous skills gaps. Um, uh, which are kind of, some of which are highlighted in the table below. Um, and these large decarbonisation projects have the potential to um, uh, exacerbate these as they pull in large quantities of skilled labour to where they're going to happen, given this chronic shortage in the UK labour market STEM, uh, STEM skilled workers. So um, these, given that when these projects go, work, go ahead, there will be quite highly paid um, and um, will probably be able to pull workers uh, who may have previously contracted in the foundation industries into their orbit and um, make it more difficult for foundation industry businesses to get day-to-day -day maintenance work done. These industrial cluster projects will create many as approximately 10,000 permanent new jobs, but uh, they may even struggle to go ahead due to the chronic uh, lack of skilled labour in the UK. Um, and just building on those, some of those comments from uh, workers in the previous slide, um, improved training on what climate change means for foundation industry workers is needed to ensure that workers feel more connected and engaged on net zero. Um, yep, so I'm nearly finished. Just to conclude, um, what I've been saying, most foundation industry businesses are located outside industrial clusters, so won't receive access to hydrogen um, or carbon capture and storage in time for net zero. Although these technologies are not necessarily suitable for all industrial wastes and processes anyway, but they, they likely will be in the near future. Uh, government commitments to decarbonisation are rhetorical rather than backed up by funding. High energy costs are making survival difficult in, for foundation industries in a globalised market. Circular economy strategies um, are not a priority for business or government. Um, an undiverse and, and ageing work, aging workforce means that businesses in the foundation industries are focused more on immediate re recruitment challenges than the skills needed for net zero. Um, and um, industrial cluster decarbonisation projects may exacerbate skills shortages for um, uh, foundation industries. Um, and the challenges of decarbonisation uh, in the UK and the lack of policy support means that further shrinkage of, UK, of the UK foundation industry sector a distinct possibility. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, really. Uh, so, um, we saw uh, quite uh, some uh, uh, divergent uh, trend and, and, and dualities or, or divisions that uh, are also interesting uh, and linked to what we have seen in the previous reports that the regional dimension is really important and in the UK this cluster non-cluster um, um, uh, uh, dichotomy is is comes uh, clearly into uh, the play and then also the skills uh, issue so uh, we will get into a discussion after the uh, uh, second presentation uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we will continue uh, with uh, Italy. Uh, we have a comprehensive Italian report uh, in this project uh, that is, uh, was prepared by the uh, Fondazione Vittorio in Roma. Uh, we cannot uh, have this uh, presentation today. Uh, uh, Matteo Mantelli, University of Milan, and, uh, and uh, also a research, uh, guest researcher at the TUI for a couple of months this year, uh, will present a unique case, uh, the case of uh, Southern Italy, Taranto, uh, that had already had a long history of conflicts, and, and, and Matteo will 
focus on this. Uh, so by this, we have kind of uh, different approaches in this project. We had econometric analysis, we had uh, uh, national studies, and we also have a case study. So Matteo, please, um, um, uh, good to see you and uh, thanks for um, uh, coming. Uh, so you have 20 minutes now. Yeah, I'll share the screen. Can you see it? Can you hear me? Just... Well, yeah, well, oh yeah, sure. All right, perfect. So um, thank you for, so much for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, uh, it's a real pity that I couldn't be there in presence. Uh, I would have really loved to, to come to Brussels and see you all back again, but uh, just because I couldn't make it. And so uh, here I am, I hope it still works uh, this way and we can still have a, a fruitful conversation on this. Um, so uh, as Bella was saying, um, our paper, which is by uh, me and my colleague Luca, uh, focuses on trade unions facing the so-called eco-social growth dilemma, uh, prospects and hurdles for just transition solution to the Taranto crisis. So we focused on uh, Taranto, which is a, a city in uh, southern Italy, Apulia, and on its uh, steel company known as uh, former ILVA. Uh, as Bella already said, uh, this is not the Italian report, which was brilliantly done uh, by Serena Ruggiero, but it's just a uh, small uh, case that sort of complements uh, the uh, macro analysis by giving voice uh, to uh, trade unions in a specific and very conflictual uh, case. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, what we tried to do uh, was to uh, see how trade unions are facing complex industrial crisis in the era of uh, decarbonization. And so in particular, our aim was to first analyze unions' objectives, uh, disentangling economic, social, and environmental objectives, um, and then to see uh, and to map the solutions that these unions put forward to reconcile these objectives and to ultimately uh, address uh, the complex industrial crisis. As I said, uh, we did it through a qualitative case study. So uh, by conducting uh, semi-structured interviews in Taranto, uh, beyond, of course, a documentary and press analysis. Um, and we focused on uh, four trade unions in particular, which are the most uh, representative uh, in uh, the steel industry in Taranto. Uh, these are the three uh, metal mechanics sections of the three largest uh, confederal unions in Italy. So so Will, Fiom, and, and FIM, and then also a grassroots union, which is uh, USB. Um, so our starting point, uh, or our analytical framework, uh, was the so-called eco-social growth dilemma. So this construct uh, basically allows us to, uh, uh, again, to disentangle uh, different uh, in political objectives uh, as and, and consider them separately. So we have economic growth, social protection, and environmental protection. Um, but this dilemma particularly uh, points uh, attention to the role of politics in channeling uh, the uh, claims from these three uh, different and separate spheres, and in trying to reconcile them, to make them uh, mutually reinforcing, and to uh, address the possible conflicts and trade-offs that can uh, arise from uh, pursuing these three objectives separately. And of course, in the realm of politics, um, several different political and social uh, actors uh, are confronted with such dilemmas, including, of course, uh, trade unions. So there's a huge uh, literature uh, that actually has investigated uh, trade unions facing this kind of dilemma. And the main approach on this is uh, labor environmentalism, um, which basically investigates trade unions' attitudes towards the so-called jobs versus environment dilemma. Uh, this basically refers to a situation where trade unions would be forced to choose between maintaining uh, jobs uh, and uh, in, in, in ensuring environmental uh, protection. And uh, traditionally, this literature has identified two opposite positions that trade unions can take to address this dilemma. Uh, this dilemma. Uh, so on the one hand, we have purely industrialist accounts that are based on the so-called treadmill of production, so uh, for which uh, in, in, in industries and uh, employment are stuck on a pattern that has to be uh, environmentally degrading uh, because it, of course, uh, consumes a lot of natural resources and pollutes uh, a lot. And this results in unions uh, opposing or not giving any attention to environmental 
objectives. However, on the other hand, labor environmentalism has also identified how trade unions can actually uh, be endorsed in a just transition patterns uh, that um, aim to reconcile labor and environmental objectives. Uh, just transition in the context of decarbonization has been defined as a fair and equitable process of moving towards a post carbon society. Uh, however, as this concept becomes uh, more and more salient both politically uh, and in uh, the uh, academic debate, uh, various uh, different conceptualization of the same notion have uh, arisen, um, for which uh, different actors may actually assign different meanings to just transition. And in particular, uh, the literature distinguish uh, between affirmative and transformative just transition approaches um, with respect to uh, trade unions views on the prevailing model of industrial capitalism. So on the one hand, we can have the view that uh, industrial capitalism can be fixed through basically ecological modernization and technology uh, advancements. And on the other hand, we have more ecologist accounts that instead do not find any viable solution in uh, industrial capitalism. And a various conception of just transition can also be distinguished according to uh, the spatial temporal scope of the environmental challenges that they consider. So on the one hand, we have narrower challenges uh, that basically are localized sector specific challenges, um, short term challenges, very urgent that have to do with what is called the sustainability of the life world. So uh, with, sustain with environmental sustainability here and now. Uh, and on the other hand, we have broader challenges that are instead more global, uh, more long term, uh, and uh, more systemic in a way, and whole economy. And these, of course, include, importantly, uh, the fight against uh, climate change. Um, so uh, turning to our case, uh, so we, we've chosen to focus on, on Taranto and on uh, uh, the, the, the firm known as former Ilva, which is the largest steel plant in Italy and one of the largest in the whole uh, European Union, uh, because it represents a paradigmatic uh, case where uh, a multifaceted industrial crisis has been present for a very long period of time now. So on the one hand, this crisis is economic because um, former Ilva represents 25% of the total Italian steel production. So of course, it's a very important company also in the uh, specific area of uh, Taranto. It's a social crisis because it employs a lot of people, actually uh, 10,000 plus in 2018, only uh, of direct workers. Uh, this figure becomes double if we count indirect employment through ancillary companies uh, in, a, in an area that is characterized by uh, high uh, unemployment rates, 11.3%, and low employment rates, 45%. Uh, and finally, it's an environmental crisis, uh, not just because uh, of the challenges related to decarbonization, which we've heard a lot about today, uh, but because of the uh, chemicals pollutions of uh, these uh, production um, that have been deemed from uh, a technical report commissioned by the judiciary in Taranto as the cause of illnesses and death events. Actually, uh, this report has found that uh, people living in the surrounding areas of the factory uh, are much more likely uh, to uh, be subject to uh, death by uh, cancer. And the same goes for uh, the workers that actually uh, work in this uh, company. Um, so here's a, a, a historical background with the main developments of the story. If there's any Italian in, in the audience, they will know that the story is much more complicated than this. And it's very, it's been silent for, for several years, but just uh, because we don't have time to go through the whole story. Uh, in a nutshell, what happened is that in 2012, the conflict erupted through uh, a decision by the court in Taranto. Uh, the basically, uh, because they found uh, it, the, 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 the pollution uh, causing so much death rates, uh, they um, ordered the seizure of the plant and the arrest of 10 heads of the company. Then the company was put under uh, government supervision between 2013 and 2017. It was then purchased by ArcelorMittal, which also concluded uh, an agreement with the trade unions and the government in 2018. But then this uh, agreement uh, was uh, actually uh, with, I mean, ArcelorMittal withdrawn from the agreement and from the location contract, opening another crisis in Taranto, which resulted in the former government uh, announcing the nationalization of the plant, as well as a new industrial plant uh, to um, introduce an electric furnace and to construct two 
direct uh, reduced iron plants, uh, as well as the commitment to uh, use uh, hydrogen in the long run in the steel production of former ILVA, which was also complemented by investment from the National Recovery and Resilience Plan um, on um, research and development in, in this field. So uh, the research so far has already a kind of tried to investigate the role of trade unions uh, in, in this uh, complex crisis in, in Taranto. Uh, initial studies um, were uh, pitting uh, unions positions uh, against each other, so trying to distinguish environmentalist accounts from more industrialist accounts. But more recent studies have underlined how we should go beyond this very dichotomous uh, classification and try to actually understand what are the complexity of unions' positions in uh, this uh, field. So uh, against this backdrop, we try to fill existing gaps in the specific literature on trade unions in Taranto. First of all, updating existing knowledge uh, to today's uh, dynamic context, which is characterized, as we've heard a lot this morning, by the EU commitment to decarbonization by 2050 and by the nationalization of uh, former ILVA. And on the other hand, uh, there's a need to focus on um, concrete solution proposed by the unions beyond their mere narratives and uh, normative attitudes. And we really think that focusing on concrete solution would help us understanding uh, the complexity of these uh, unions' uh, approaches. Uh, so turning to the empirical investigation and how we've or organized uh, our, um, basically our data. Um, so we try to apply the eco-social growth dilemma uh, to the case of Taranto, trying to see how unions uh, frame the complex industrial crisis that I just described and disentangling their objectives into three different categories. So in the economic sphere, this would mean for unions to preserve steel production. In the social sphere, we have two different objectives, uh, guaranteeing high uh, occupation and, and consequent uh, income, um, and uh, of course, also health and safety at the workplace. Um, and finally, in the environmental sphere, we can distinguish two types of objectives right now uh, for, for unions to consider in Taranto. First of all, reducing chemical pollution, which uh, uh, we define through our analytical categories as a narrower, more urgent uh, kind of uh, environmental uh, challenge for unions. And on the other hand, cutting greenhouse gas emissions, so to contribute to the fight against uh, climate change, which we define as a broader um, it's a broader issue. And of course, reconciling this objective is not easy because it, it arises other challenges for unions, uh, which have to do on uh, with how to actually make these objectives compatible. And it rises different conflicts that ultimately can lead to a trilemma. Uh, so uh, we've also, uh, against this, uh, this backdrop, we've also tried to map which are the possible solutions on the table uh, for unions to consider, which are the solutions that they have considered and, and the ones that they are advocating for right now. Um, and we've uh, analyzed these solutions according to how they contribute to the three um, objectives of the trilemma and the sub-objectives that we've identified uh, before. And so for each solution, we see uh, which is the goal, basically, that trade unions are prioritizing and which is the one that they're not prioritizing, basically. So uh, first solution is maintaining the status quo, so maintaining uh, the industrial uh, production of steel as it is in former ILVA. This would, of course, uh, guarantee preserving steel production, so the economic objective, and also uh, the current occupational level. However, of course, uh, this solution would be definitely detrimental in environmental terms and also when it comes to health and safety at the workplace. Uh, the second solution, uh, which has been proposed by FIOM in uh, 2018, so uh, by one of our interviewee uh, unions, is uh, so-called ambientalizzazione, which basically um, um, translates into environmentalization. Um, and this implies um, complementing the government's plan to electrify the production in former ILVA with the use of best available technologies, for instance, filters so as to significantly reduce the chemical pollution that are causing so much health care problems in uh, Taranto. So as you can see, this would allow to preserve the steel production, but at the same time to reduce industrial uh, pollution and health and safety at the workplace. Um, 
However, ambientalizzazione raises two concerns for you for uh, for unions. First of all, uh, occupational level are uncertain uh, because, of course, uh, unions know that the, the the number of employees would have to be reduced, but they don't know how many of them and what would happen to the redundant workers or uh, to workers that would have to be uh, reskilled, basically. And second of all, uh, ambientalizzazione will still um, make the steel production in Taranto relying on uh, carbon uh, sources, so on coal. And this would mean that uh, this uh, scenario does not imply decarbonization and so cutting of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in uh, the production. Of course, this would happen with the third solution, which is decarbonization through the use of hydrogen, uh, which is the solution proposed by former uh, government uh, Conte and from uh, the president of the Apulia region in order to uh, cut uh, exactly greenhouse gas emissions. However, our interviewees, our, uh, the unions that we've talked with, uh, underline how this scenario would be uncertain with respect to economic and social objectives. So, so they uh, do not know uh, whether steel production can be uh, actually guaranteed with the same levels of production as, as today. And they do not know what's going to happen in terms of occupation and health and safety. And so this is uh, kind of um, more uncertain in, in their view. Finally, we have dismantling of of the factory, uh, which of course is the opposite solution as maintaining the status quo. It would imply, of course, uh, meeting all the environmental objectives, um, health and safety uh, at the workplace, but at the same time, it would be negative when it comes to preservancy production by definition, and uh, for in terms of uh, occupational level, especially in a territory that so much depends on this factory for uh, jobs. So what are our fundings? What are the unions endorsing with respect to these different solutions? So uh, when it comes to economic objectives, we find the convergence of the three uh, confederal unions on preservancy production. And they, do, uh, they justify this position not only in light of economic growth, but also by uh, stating that preserving steel production in Taranto would be a national strategic objective for Italy not to be dependent on basically imports of steel from other countries. Um, however, uh, the USB, the grassroots union, uh, be, is critical uh, in terms of uh, the possibility to uh, keep uh, production open and to find a solution within uh, industrial uh, capitalism as it is. Uh, on social objectives, of course, uh, as expected, every union uh, converge uh, on the need to ensure occupational level and health and safety on the workplace. And on environmental objectives, all the different unions also converge, but they all converge on uh, the need to ensure uh, the, the tackling of narrow objectives. So uh, basically to cut um, chemical pollutions and the health negative health effects that this pollution has. This means that the main concern for union is this one and not really uh, cutting uh, greenhouse gas emission. This does not mean that the unions that we've interviewed are against climate change or climate deniers, but actually when they frame environmental objectives, what they talk about is chemical uh, pollution. Um, and so what are the possible solutions out there for unions and who supports what? So the status quo is no longer supported. Initially, this seemed to be supported by the confederal unions in 2012, but nobody uh, is supporting this anymore. And they are very strong in saying that this is not a feasible nor desirable solution anymore. Uh, ambientalizzazione, which, as I said, was the uh, original, um, it was an original proposal by FIOM, uh, has found the convergence of all the confederal unions, which strongly advocate for this scenario as a way to reconcile environmental, social, and economic objectives. Decarbonization through hydrogen finds a widespread skepticism both on, on the side of confederal unions and grassroots unions, um, because these unions basically say that there's too many structural barriers and uncertainties related to decarbonization. And it seems that basically Taranto is stuck on a path dependence on coal, uh, for which these unions say that there's no, not an available technologies for a conversion to uh, hydrogen, the infrastructure are, are not there, and also uh, a question arises for the availability of um, energy sources in general, especially um, in, in a time where there's uh, an energy, a possible energy crisis, uh, given the dependency 
on uh, Russia and uh, what's going on with uh, the war. Um, and dismantling, finally, uh, was USB's uh, original proposal in 2018, uh, but now it has been abandoned due to the lack of political support. So basically the Five Star Movement uh, that originally supported this proposal alongside USB is not advocating for dismantling anymore. And this resulted in USB having sort of a critical approach to the possibility to find a new solution, but at the same time, not endorsing any specific solution anymore. So they're not proposing anything and they are basically uh, very skeptical and critical of uh, the possibility to find a solution. So um, in general, all the trade unions that we've identified uh, show a widespread distrust in the Italian government uh, that is accused to uh, have um, mismanaged uh, the situation uh, to, um, to, 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 to be um, basically um, not transparent, especially when it comes to showing what is the in current industrial plan for uh, Taranto. And so, um, in general, we find this very this, this very distrust uh, in in the government and and the feeling that uh, decarbonization is going to be uh, very very difficult uh, in these terms. I'm just going very quickly through the conclusion. I don't know how much time I have left, but basically. The idea was to uh, try uh, this research was to try to see how can we overcome the jobs versus environment dilemma, right? The, 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 the central question of labor environmentalism. So we argue, first of all, that uh, jobs versus environment dilemma does not fully um, give account of the complexity of the challenges that union face in this against this industrial crisis. And we think uh, and we argue that the eco-social growth dilemma provides uh, a much richer analytical framework to analyze their positions and preferences. Um, and also empirically, uh, we, we think that uh, we are beyond the jobs versus environment dilemma, even in Taranto, even in a context that's so uh, characterized by, by industrial crisis, because all the unions seem to, um, to endorse a just transition approach to reconcile uh, social and environmental objectives. However, the question is, which type of just transition? So we said the just transition is sort of becoming a contested concept, which can mean several and different things. So what does it mean in Taranto for unions specifically? Um, it's a narrow conception, of course, when it comes to the environmental challenges that they consider. As I said, they're not climate deniers, but when they talk about environmental challenges with respect to a former ILVA, uh, what they refer to is the chemical pollution that is basically killing uh, people and has been killing people for several years in the surrounding area. So a question arises for what is the future of decarbonization and of the European Green Deal objectives in the specific case of Taranto, so in a framework that's already characterized by strong political uh, crisis and conflict. And second of all, um, there's a prevalence of affirmative uh, position. Uh, this is the way that the literature calls this kind of just transition position. Uh, so positions that believe that through a technological fix, it is possible to maintain uh, the patterns of industrial capitalism, uh, just as long as we invest in a technology. Um, but USB is an interesting, so the grassroots union that we've uh, interviewed is an interesting exception here, because although uh, it is not proposing any solution anymore, they still strongly uh, believe that it would not be possible, basically, to save uh, former ILVA, and that we, we should find different pathways uh, towards ensuring uh, economic growth, social protection, and environmental protection outside of, um, of um, industrialism. Basically. So I thank you so much for your attention, uh, and I look forward for the discussion. And, and again, uh, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. It was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was really good to have a concrete case uh, that uh, brings these dilemmas a little bit uh, closer. So uh, we have 15 minutes roughly uh, to uh, for questions uh, uh, or comments on both the UK um, uh, report and to the Taranto case. So. Um, Anybody from the audience, please, uh, in the back row. Uh, um, Andreas Bodemer, IG Metall. 
Um, I was just wondering what is USP, what does grassroots union mean? That could be a lot. Okay, so we have one question. Let's see uh, bef uh, before going back uh, uh, if we have uh, more. Benjamin Denis from uh, Industrial Europe. Uh, uh, I had a question for Matteo. I, I wanted Matteo to elaborate a bit further on what specifically the concept of ambientalization, sorry for my Italian, uh, specifically means in the uh, EVA context. Um, and, and I have a sub question. Um, if I well understood what you, what you meant uh, with this concept, uh, you would still keep uh, a strong uh, carbon footprint for the steel production. And so my, my, my sub question is therefore, what kind of um, um, perspective could such a steel company have if we go for um, a carbon price, much higher carbon price in the, in the EU with the uh, revision of the, of the ETS, which is currently discussed? Uh, yes, so we have then two questions uh, to, to Matteo, um, not really uh, uh, more from the audience, I didn't see uh, from the chat, so I would, uh, so Vera, yes. Yes, thank you. I also have a question to Matteo. Oh, very uh, good. Me too. <laughs> Is that okay yes, to ask? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so really great presentation, Matteo. Really, really interesting. Um, um, yeah, so I, I thought you did a really good job in terms of um, breaking down the concepts of just transition and applying it to an empirical case study. So I was really interested in that. And um, we are just kicking off um, a project on just transition comparing 10 different countries. Um, we don't have Italy as a case study. We have Spain um, as a kind of state-led capitalism, maybe. So, but my question would would so I would love to continue this discussion maybe later in terms of how you really make the choices of the cases that are then really interesting, and also to policymakers in particular. But for this case, I mean, it's it's a it's a little bit. Um, um, a, a disappointing result maybe that that there's only a kind of narrow conception uh from unions and i was would be interested in your kind of estimation is there scope for change so do you see that if you look at the kind of broader um positioning of the italian uh, unions is there movement so is that limited to a kind of particular case of heavy industry with all the past dependencies um if if it would be let's say glass industry would the picture be already a little bit different so maybe an invitation to put this into the broader perspective of the italian unions thank you yes and i see before we go back to matteo uh, uh joe you were also uh raising hand so is yeah. it a question yeah yeah, I, I, again, a question for Matteo. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, really, really uh, interesting case. And um, maybe it's a similar-ish question to those that have come before, but thinking, you mentioned the kind of grassroots unionism, union, unionis, union was prom promoting this sort of out, ideas outside of industrialism. So A, I would be interested to hear what those kind of propositions are. Um, and in a sense, where does this, come from is is there something about the makeup of that union that uh, that brings them to this conclusion but yeah great really interested to hear more about it uh, yes so i mean uh, many questions then for Matteo. Uh, uh, i would only add one thing uh, uh, that uh, as i said uh, we have a full um, overarching um, italian case study uh, I would only pick one thing out of it that uh, that uh, uh, opposite than what you would expect uh, and what we, for example, saw in the car industry in Italy, a complete collapse. Uh, in the energy intensive industry in the last 10 years, uh, looking back, 
uh, uh, employment situation was rather stable uh, and the output was actually growing. Uh, so in, in four out of, uh, let's say the five um, uh, 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 foundational industries, uh, 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 there was actually a growth in terms of output and in employment uh, uh, kind of stagnation, but there was like nothing like, like, like terrible thing happened. Uh, it's just uh, in addition, and uh, a, a one quick question after uh, Matteo uh, uh, responds uh, to all this. Uh, one question then to UK. Um, well, um, maybe, uh, so we saw the, the regional disparities there, which is very uh, clear, uh, the lack of commitment from the government. Um, how you would uh, um, frame the, the main challenge uh, for the UK and uh, in terms of employment uh, uh, perspective in those industries uh, and probably if, if in one word or small sentence you could uh, reflect on uh, any expectation on the carbon adjustment mechanism from UK perspective. Uh, so uh, Matteo, yeah, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I'm happy that, that, that this case has generated uh, su such attention. I don't know how much I would be able to respond fully to these very, uh, these very important questions, but I'm going to try to. So, um, and uh, so uh, regarding the grassroots unions, uh, so basically, uh, Fiom, Fim, and Wilm are the um, basically the. Um, Meta mechanics uh, sectors of the three uh, confederal biggest confederal unions uh, in Italy. Um, whereas basically uh, USB with the finest grassroots for for a couple of reasons. The first reason is uh, the way that it is organized. Uh, so it is uh, unlike the three other unions uh, and unionists at the local level. Their decision making is independent from uh, the central uh, organization, basically. Uh, whereas of course uh, for uh, the for Fiom, Fim and Wilma, it's uh, the opposite. And then second of all, uh, this is not really related to the grassroots uh, thing, but it's more related uh, to the other question um, about their position. Uh, ideologically, uh, USB uh, comes from uh, basically um, an internal, an internal uh, conflict within FIOM. Uh, and it was sort of a group of uh, more leftist uh, unionists that, that funded these organizations. So ideologically, uh, they are also uh, more uh, on the left, let's say, than, than, than the confederal unions. Uh, but what this position also came from, so basically in, in 2018, or be, be just before 2018, the Five Star Movement uh, was running for government back then, and they were proposing for uh, Taranto basically the complete dismantling of uh, the factory, which of course uh, found a coalition of actors uh, at the local level, which included uh, citizens' organizations, uh, environmental NGOs, and USB as a union. So all these different social political actors agreed that the factory should have been shut down uh, immediately. Of course, with due uh, redundancy payments and uh, different uh, other uh, types of social supports. Uh, however, when when uh, Five Star Movement came into government, basically they changed completely this position and Five Star Movement was responsible for uh, the agreement with ArcelorMittal actually. So a <laughs> complete tournament of position with respect to, to their previous position and this left kind of USB in, in a limbo kind of. So before that, they were very uh, pro dismantling. Uh, they were very, they were advocating uh, for this as an, ecolo an ecologist, the labor ecologist solution to the crisis. But now, of course, they're just, they just have to recognize the fact that this solution is not politically feasible anymore. There's no uh, po political coalition that would actually um, allow for the dismantling of the, of the factory as for right now. And this is the reason why um, they are still remain critical. They're, they're very fatalist when it comes to the future of former ILVA, but they're also not really proposing an alternative solution because they don't find alternative solution in this. Um, with respect to uh, ambientalizzazione, um, so what it means is basically to complement uh, the current Italian plan for uh, the um, for former ILVA, which is, um, as I said, is not uh, 
publicly formalized into a document, but it's a result of several declarations that have been done by uh, both the current and the former government. Um, and basically the plan of the government is to uh, introduce an electric furnace and to uh, build two uh, DRI plants. Um, and basically Ambiente Rituzione says, okay, let's complement this with uh, also the use of best available technologies to introduce filters that would allow to reduce the chemical pollutions that are killing people uh, in, 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 in Taranto and, then, and that are so uh, damaging for uh, health. Uh, so this is what Ambiente Rituzione entails, but of course uh, it would still mean that the, the production uh, processes uh, are reliant on uh, on coal. Um, and so what are the perspectives was, was another question. I mean, uh, several people that advocate for decarbonization through hydrogen basically see this solution, decarbonization as a long-term plan that should go through ambientalization. So ambientalization would be the first step and then the second step in the long run would be to uh, convert to a hydrogen-based production and achieve decarbonization. However, what we find is that really uh, there's no plan to do so. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of declarations, there's a lot of commitment, there's some funds in the Recovery Resilience Fund uh, to invest in research and development on hydrogen for hard to abate industries, but there's no plan for going from uh, ambientalization to decarbonization. So unions, of course, after 10 years of uh, promises, uh, changes at, at, the, at the firm level, at the government level, unions are basically developing a very um, fatalistic and very negative account on the future of ILVA. So honestly, what are the perspectives for decarbonization? I don't know, because uh, until, until we have a clear uh, plan that, that sets up a, a clear direction for Italy to actually decarbonize uh, this plant, of course, union, unions would be skeptical and would continue to focus on very narrower and more urgent uh, actual uh, issues than, than the long term ones. But it's just my opinion, of course, it's not uh, okay. exactly what, what, they, what they told us. I don't know if there's other things. Yeah, but the just transition in Italy. As Bella said, this is just a small part. It would, be, it would have been great if, if, this, if my speech would, would come after uh, Serena's that, were, that, that presented a much more general uh, picture of this. Of course, the Taranto case is not uh, indicative of what's happening in any sector or in any single uh, region and context in Italy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I still think that also in the just transition case, uh, as, as an Italian uh, commitment, we do not have um, a, a legal definition of just transition. We do not have uh, uh, specific fundings or, or policy instruments for just transition, say, for example, as those that, that Spain has put forward through, through its just transition strategy. So yeah, probably the yeah, other sectors are better placed than, 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 than former ILVA, but at the same time, it's not that we have a clear commitment by the government on just transition. So, Matteo, thanks a lot, really. Uh, we are running out of time, so it's only a very short, um, well, point, if you can make um, on behalf of the UK um, in yeah, I'm happy one to one minute. Yeah, one minute. So it's I think the, the main result is that there is a too heavy reliance on technology and not enough policies. And if workers are not involved enough, that's a really low involvement. And where it's existing, like in the steel industry, it's not very effective. So the steel industry, we would argue, is still at risk uh, in, in terms of its existence in the UK. Um, and that is mirrored in a recent survey we have done with workers, a representative survey. So the consultation on decarbonization is, is basically very, very low in the UK. And that is something where the, the unions um, have to take action on, I think. So uh, thank you uh, to all of you uh, for the two interesting uh, presentations. So with that, uh, we came to the end of the uh, uh, country uh, or case uh, specific studies, and we will have a policy roundtable debate uh, with uh, the main uh, political actors, uh, trade unions, uh, an employer organization and the European Commission. Uh, 
uh, uh, discussing uh, these uh, developments and, and uh, uh, alternatives. So, um, uh, yes, um, we are getting into this uh, debate. Uh, we have uh, Judith here in presence. Uh, and uh, Yeah, so hello, Judith. Hello, thank you. Yes, you are a little bit lonely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I hope that's um, yeah, yes, uh, okay. Uh, we have um, connection and traffic. Oh, yes, sure. Okay, so we can connect. Or... Yeah, but they're moving cameras. Ah, okay. So, um, so then, of course, so, so then uh, welcome uh, our uh, participants to the panel discussion. And so we will have uh, two uh, online uh, participants uh, and one uh, live. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. So, first, uh, Flori Gonsolen uh, from CEFIC, uh, the uh, employer organization uh, for the chemical industry. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you uh, for being with us, um, uh, discussing uh, the main uh, policy challenges uh, these industries are facing. Uh, Frank Siebern from the European Commission. Uh, hello, Frank. Thanks a lot. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, hello, I and... hope you can hear me. Oh, yes, 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 uh, sound is okay. Uh, and, and Judith Curtin Darling from the uh, Europe, uh, so the industry all, uh, General, uh, Deputy General Secretary, uh, also uh, very closely monitoring energy intensive industries. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, we will go uh, uh, as in the uh, agenda it was uh, uh, suggested. Uh, I would suggest, like, 10 minutes um, uh, input from, from each of you, the way uh, given uh, also uh, what we have seen as policy challenges uh, in, uh, well, anyway, what we see, but then also these uh, reports were highlighting uh, uh, what you see uh, 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 as most uh, challenges given also the current um, uh, 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 policy uh, environment. So, Judith first uh, in, in 10 minutes, and then, then we will come back uh, uh, and continue. Cool. Um, well, I just uh, stress that I think we're all alive, uh, but I'm happy to be here um, in person. Uh, so, uh, it, it's a real uh, pleasure to join um, and to have heard the uh, the previous uh, case studies as well, um, partly because for industrial Europe, this is, if you like, our bread and butter now. Um, transformation of industry is uh, the, the biggest topic that we have right across our membership. Um, and it's clear that uh, the transition um, for, in, particularly in energy intensive industries, the uh, transition in terms of um, climate objectives is, um, is really uh, an existential um, challenge for many of our issue uh, for many of our um, industries, um, and uh, I really liked the uh, the term. I mean, we talk still at European level about energy intensive industries, but actually the term foundation industries is a much nicer term in a sense because um, many of these industries are at are fundamental for um, longer supply chains and feeding into other sectors in Europe and the um, continuing presence of um, these industries in Europe are vital if we're looking at a wider manufacturing base across the, the whole of the continent. So um, this is really an existential challenge for us. We know that um, reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 is um, a colossal challenge. Um, reaching minus 55% by 2030 
is an extraordinary challenge. Um, and there are different dimensions to it. I think we've heard, and I'm sure this morning as well in the other case studies you heard, the challenges in relation to technology, technology readiness, the reality of certain technologies um, and technology pathways, um, the infrastructure challenges, energy sources and the availability of affordable, abundant energy, which will be needed for certain technology pathways, uh, particularly the increased electrification of industries, logistics and supply chains. Um, and, um, and obviously for us, the, uh, the top concern is that, and I think this came very clearly through uh, the UK case study that we just heard, in fact, is that um, the majority of the policy focus is on those elements, those other four elements of the, the challenges. Um, far less attention is paid to the social uh, dimension, which is often uh, summarized as a skills challenge or a challenge of a skills workforce, but actually it's a much broader um, worker focused social dimension, um, which, um, which we believe is unfortunately potentially the Achilles heel of the Green Deal, unless there is a turbocharging, in fact, of the uh, social dimension within, um, within the policy, so, and within the policy framework. So um, within Industrial Europe, um, we have uh, committed as a European Trade Union Federation to the objective of where we've got to get to in 2030 and in 2050. We're no longer talking as trade unions about the, the if, um, what we're talking about is the how and the, the policy mix which is needed to achieve those um, climate objectives. And I say that as a result of many, many conversations at the level of our executive committee and union leaders, but also um, within uh, different sectoral networks, within uh, uh, different um, frameworks. What we are um, very concerned about, if I just focus my 10 minutes, I don't go too much into the other, other dimensions, um, big challenges in terms of energy, massive challenges in terms of raw materials. Um, at the current context is making this um, even more difficult, and particularly for the parts of Europe where the challenge of decarbonisation is far higher. If we uh, normally, um, I would have brought a slide which showed where energy intensive industries are in Europe, and then uh, the GDP um, of in different regions across Europe, and you see a very neat overlap for the most energy intensive um, regions of Europe are also in many cases some of the most um, deprived regions of Europe comparatively across the whole of the EU and the challenge in terms of investment to transform those industries is absolutely colossal um, but also many of those industries have had supply chains which are now directly impacted by the war in Ukraine um, the impact of um, Russian sanctions um, and supply chains to Ukraine so we have an extremely volatile and a, and a very complicated context in which we're operating. And despite that, um, there is a, a renewed commitment from our executive committee, which met in Stockholm uh, last week, that the route um, towards uh, 2050 is still the right compass, if you like. But that challenging com uh, context that we find ourselves in means that the urgency of the social dimension is even more than when we put forward our demands when the Fit for 55 package was published in July last year, where we said the absence of a social dimension was really um, a fundamental weakness of the package. Now we're very clear that this is the Achilles heel um, of the package. And that's why uh, two weeks ago, uh, we, and I brought a few copies with me, but they're all online and in very many European languages. Um, we published um, a manifesto, a, a short manifesto with our core demands and a longer manifesto detailing the reasoning behind our, our demands for a just transition framework at European level. Up till now, what we see is hard law when it comes to the technological dimension, when it comes to the energy dimension, when it comes to the um, industrial um, uh, dimension and potentially an upcoming raw materials act which will um, uh, tackle some of the raw materials questions but what we see is 
extremely soft law and I apologize to Frank uh, for, for this he's gonna um, no doubt present uh, this agenda from the Commission but he knows our criticisms uh, very well but at the moment what we see at European level is extremely soft solutions to the social dimension and the skills dimension basically uh, the in the form of draft council recommendations which are currently being discussed in in the um the council for employment and social affairs and um and in um in a number of other in flanking initiatives around skills packed for skills and and so on and in our view these are just not capable of actually dealing with the industrial revolution that we're embarked on um in in our industries and they're also not capable of de delivering the anticipation agenda which is fundamentally needed to ensure that there's fair worker involvement and participation in the process and our concern about worker involvement and the anticipation agenda is kind of twofold if you like if you don't involve workers right from the start right from the beginning of strategy building then what you are doing is you're turning the workforce and the population into the recipients of policy and not proactive actors in the development of policy Equally, you're creating a seedbed in which people have to deal with the ramifications of policy, restructuring and closures and job losses and the challenging side without being part of identifying positive alternative routes for the transformation of their industries, their communities um, and workplaces. And that is that will have political consequences for Europe a long way into the future. And I say that as somebody coming from a steel town, steel and chemicals town in the northeast of England, which voted against an export region that voted against its own interests to leave the European Union, largely on the basis that people felt extremely left behind by policy and decisions and that they weren't being listened to and they weren't involved. We have to learn some of those lessons and that means a far more proactive agenda around um, anticipation, a renewed agenda around um, information consultation, rights for workers, the right to be involved in the strategy building of companies, the right to be involved in developing regional development um, plans for regions, the right to be involved in strategy building at sectoral level. When we think about the Italian example, what we're seeing from our Italian unions is a massive frustration in the lack of um, industrial strategy at the moment from the um, from the Italian government in the case of the automotive industry, which will, and I know you had a, a seminar on the automotive uh, sector a few weeks ago, the automotive industry under colossal pressure um, and potentially a, a very damaging situation in Italy and a complete lack of an industrial policy agenda from the um, state level. Equally, that frustration is in some of the energy intensive industries, but we have really good examples in Italy as well, where we have in the chemicals sector and in the energy sector, really strong just transition agreements at national level negotiated by the unions looking forward looking and also at company level in companies like any um, and and others looking at a very radical transformation and involving unions right at the beginning of the process so what we've tried to do within our just transition manifesto is bring together concrete examples from the national level, the sectoral level, the company level, the local level, to demonstrate why this European framework is so urgently needed. My last word, because I think I used my uh, 10 minutes, is that um, soft law won't deliver this. So we are being as innovative as we can be, and we are using every opportunity uh, that we can in the context of the Fit for 55 uh, package to try and drill social policy or a social dimension and the just transition concept which for us is a concept about worker involvement let's be very clear it's about worker involvement and anticipation of change this is the two fundamental parts of it for us that we want that concept to be actually tied into the hard law of european climate and energy policy and so next week the european parliament will vote 
on the reports, the revision of the um, emissions trading scheme, the uh, report on uh, the revision of uh, targets for, for car emissions, the revision of the Lulu CF, which covers some of our energy intensive industries like paper and pulp, um, and, and a number of other um, uh, initiatives as part of the Fit for 55 package. And what we've done together with the ETUC and other industry fed, uh, trade union federations at European level is plug the demands that we've made in our manifesto into that hard legislation with the hope that politicians will recognize that the scale of this industrial revolution, if we don't get the social revolution which has to accompany it, right, that social dimension will actually undermine uh, the route that uh, that we need to take to make uh, the changes in our industries that are needed to get us to 2050. Um, I'll stop there and uh, yeah. I'm happy to debate this further. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm passing the word to um, uh, uh, Flori uh, Gonsolin from uh, SAFIC, uh, from the industry perspective, uh, at least from the chemical industry point of view. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, apologies, I couldn't be there with you this uh, this afternoon, but I will have to, to connect to another um, discussion uh, at uh, 3.30. So um, therefore I, I only appear on screen. Uh, maybe just to um, also specify that I don't represent uh, the employers uh, here, which is another organization, ESSEC, but CEFIC, uh, I represent CEFIC, which is the, the Confederation of European uh, Chemical Industry Federations. Um, so I think um, first, I mean, the chemical industry has the ambition to become climate neutral by 2050. Uh, this is the direction that was clearly set by our masters a, a few years ago. And I think as uh, Judith said earlier, the question is not anymore about the how, but really looking at the how, uh, at the what, sorry, but uh, rather looking at the how and um, how we, we make uh, this, uh, this uh, objective, climate objective uh, materialize. Uh, one initiative, we have a major initiative of CEFIC uh, that uh, we have pursued in, in the last uh, few months and years um, in order to really walk the talk there is to develop our own uh, IT modeling uh, tool around the transition of the chemical sector. We call it IC2050. And the model allows us to um, explore all kinds of different scenarios uh, to reach the climate neutrality or um, to have climate neutral chemical production by 2050 um, by setting different hypotheses and constraints. So it's really not about forecasting um, the, the future, but working with what if um, and, and see what is the, the um, resulting outcome from, uh, from each of the, the scenario that, uh, that we choose to explore in terms of resource demand for the sector. That is one point that was mentioned by Judith earlier, uh, the costs of the different uh, scenarios and, and, and so on. And that really allows us uh, first to, to bring further our understanding uh, and common knowledge inside the industry, but also outside uh, with the European Commission on the, uh, for example, on the enabling, uh, on the key enablers for, for the transition of, uh, of the sector. Um, as Judith also mentioned, I mean, like uh, over um, foundational industries, that's also um, the kind of, uh, um, let's say, uh, nomination we are trying to, to move uh, to away from energy intensive. Uh, we are deeply embedded into the EU economy through very complex uh, value chain, and it's particularly true for the chemical sector. Uh, and the, that means the chemical industry will also be a major contributor to the wider societal transformation uh, through important value chains like um, construction with uh, the renovation wave um, starting, electromobility, renewable electricity. Uh, energy production and infrastructure, electronic chips, um, you name it. But that also means that deterioration of the chemical sector's competitiveness will have ripple effects uh, across this entire value chain. So if you look at uh, the, the impact uh, of the chemical industry or the impact of policies on the chemical industry, we see that often the analysis uh, narrowly focus on uh, the chemical sector itself, which is only 2% of the GDP. But uh, what we see uh, often missing in the analysis so far is the, the wider uh, far-ranging impact uh, that 
um, deterioration of the competitiveness of the sector will have on uh, the entire value chains. And if we start uh, taking into account all the sectors uh, that can be, again, I mentioned those mobility, construction, and so on, um, that are linked to the chemical sector in one way or the other, uh, there suddenly you start seeing much bigger part of the GDP uh, of uh, the EU economy that, uh, that will be um, that would be uh, impacted by those changes and you can uh, easily uh, reach something like a quarter of the, the whole um, economy's GDP. I would also like to mention a few specificities of the chemical sector compared to the other um, foundation, foundational industry. Uh, the first is the special relation we have to carbon. So, uh, of course, uh, there is a willingness uh, of the, the sector to be less dependent on um, carbon-based uh, sources for its energy needs, but uh, that doesn't take away the fact that carbon is and will remain uh, a key building block of chemistry and that it will continue to be part of, uh, of our feedstock. So the question for us is not so much about decarbonization, apart from the energy side again, uh, but how we move to more sustainable sources of carbon. And that of course involves an element of, uh, of circularity, uh, how we better uh, valorize uh, waste streams. Uh, that can also be circularity about CO2 emissions of our factories, if we manage to capture those CO2 and reuse it as a chemical building block. And that also includes um, bio sources. But there, uh, we know there will be high competition uh, and uh, um, several sectors that will have to will want to access biomass as a resource. So, and this is uh, the kind of things that we can look at with the IC 2050 model, uh, understanding what would be the needs, um, but also look at what is the result of the constraints. Um, and the, the more, the less flexibility we take away from, uh, from the industry, the, what is the impact uh, that we see on other uh, resources um, that are necessary for, for reaching climate neutrality. Um, another, um, I would say, um, specific challenge that we have as the chemical sector is the fact uh, that we are not only undergoing a climate transformation and climate and energy transition, uh, apart from um, reaching climate neutrality, uh, becoming circular and the digital transformation, which applies to all sectors, we have the additional challenge that it is not only the way we make products uh, that will have to change, but also which products we put on the market. Uh, because with the um, strategy on sustainable chemicals that, uh, that was uh, issued a, a few years ago, uh, you probably know there is a massive wave of legislation that uh, will uh, impact um, our products and that will bring new restrictions on the, the products that we can bring uh, on the market. And that means the industry uh, will have to uh, develop substitutes uh, to current substances that are regarding as, uh, as the most um, concerning ones. Um, and that's also a major uh, challenge for, for, for the sector. Um, so this is why, um, yeah, a few months ago, uh, it was uh, decided and agreed with the European Commission in the context of the re renewed industrial strategy um, that it would make sense to develop uh, a chemical, uh, sorry, a transition pathway for the chemical sector that uh, would look at all those challenges, transitional tra challenges for the chemical sector into a holistic manner. And this is work that uh, we, we started uh, at the beginning of this year that is uh, still uh, ongoing. And um, it's really about looking at those challenges and, and see how we can combine them uh, in the most uh, efficient way while increasing the, the resilience of the sector. So one aspect we will look at, of course, is uh, uh, the current uh, regulatory landscape for, for the chemical sector. And um, if we take this holistic view at all the uh, regulatory, let's say, um, objectives uh, or obligations that the uh, sector uh, will, will have to face uh, in the near to, uh, let's say, midterm, I mean, we have the, uh, as you sort of we know the, the regulation on, uh, on uh, emissions uh, through the ETS, Energy Efficiency Directive, uh, also targets under the Renewable Energy Directive. 
we have the recently published um, revision of the industrial emissions directive. Rich revision will also be uh, a major milestone for, for the sector. We have the new initiatives coming up on the um, sustainable products regulation. We have sustainable finance, we have due diligence, um, and that's not a uh, fully uh, comprehensive list uh, I'm doing here, but just to explain that our companies, uh, there is, um, uh, we start seeing a, a sense uh, of being overwhelmed uh, from, from the companies and, uh, and more and more uh, our CEOs come to us and, and with the question, I mean, how do we manage all this at the same time? It is just not possible. So this is why we try to use the chemical transition pathway as a way to discuss how we can articulate uh, those objectives. So it's not about putting them into question, but more how to see how, how we can organize the transition in a way that is efficient and sustainable for the chemical sector. Also to increase the regulatory predictability uh, for, uh, for the industry, because that will be very important in terms of, uh, of uh, investments and making sure um, if uh, a certain alternative substance is developed uh, on, uh, for, for to replace the existing ones that uh, uh, we know there will be time to do so, to, to look for the substitutes, um, and also to increase the consistency during this, uh, between these regulations that are um, more and more interrelated and uh, because we see more and more connected thinking inside the commission. This is something we, we of course uh, welcome, but we believe even more can be done uh, in this uh, direction of ensuring uh, higher degrees of consistency. What we also see today is uh, contradicting investment signal for the sector uh, with, on one hand, as I said, uh, restrictions on products uh, expected uh, if they are implemented too early to have uh, major impact on the revenues of the sector by uh, reducing our markets. And at the same time, uh, the very high um, level of investment requirement for reaching climate neutrality and circularity objectives, and in particular, um, the increased cost of energy and, um, and, uh, and feedstock uh, linked to the search of, uh, of alternatives. Um, maybe needless to say that <laughs> in parallel, we are facing a crisis, uh, energy crisis, which uh, as you are sure you're aware is having a major impact uh, on the sector with, uh, with the very high um, oil and natural gas prices that uh, we are seeing today on the market. Um, so that's why we believe it is important that through the transition pathway, we still manage to, um, let's say, um, create a business case for the chemical industry in Europe. Uh, and that by having, uh, uh, let's say, uh, intelligent and realistic phasing of uh, the restrictions on chemical products um, still leaves business opportunities uh, for companies that want to invest uh, in Europe and uh, leave sufficient revenues to be uh, invested into alternative technologies for, for the climate transition. Uh, we also want through the transition pathway to improve the resilience uh, of the industry uh, to external shocks. This is a, a known objective from the renewed industrial strategy. Uh, this is something that is particularly relevant for the chemical sector where we see dependencies from uh, certain materials that are often sourced from a too narrow supply. So we are doing some efforts to, to really map what are the vulnerabilities of the sector in that space. Uh, of course, we also look at the enablers I and mean, how we can we facilitate the transition uh, of the sector. And in that regard, I think uh, what I will mention least here is, is uh, widely shared among the stakeholders is the need to secure access uh, to, to financial support for the sector. Uh, here, there is a particular interest toward de-risking de instruments um, through public uh, support in, for investment into first of the key technologies access to resources that was mentioned by uh, Judith uh, with um, the need to secure uh, the necessary alternatives in terms of energy feedstock and that also includes waste streams. For example, how we can improve the internal market on, and circulation of waste across borders uh, to uh, facilitate the access of industry to, to those streams. The issue of enforcement is also a key one, um, particularly relevant for uh, product regulation, but also uh, in the context of the CBAM debate. Uh, so if 
uh, the chemical sector becomes part of the, the CPAM uh, instrument that uh, um, due thinking is, uh, is done on uh, how we enforce uh, the, uh, the new rules at the borders. Um, value chain cooperation is another key one uh, because we see that today uh, competition law rules still restrict the abilities of companies or actors along the value chain to, to cooperate and jointly look for solutions. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, the skills will be uh, a key and major aspect uh, of the transition. And for us, for the sector, it will be extremely important that we secure the right skills. I can give only one example, um, which is digital. That is a key one for, for very relevant for all sectors um, to um, drive us through this, uh, this transition. That means we ourselves have to think how we remain an attractive industry uh, for, for talents, uh, for example, and how we upskill uh, workers in the, that are already working for, for the industry uh, today. Uh, last point is uh, on the importance to also look at local conditions, um, some solutions that may work for certain parts of the industry uh, may not be accessible to other parts of the industry. This is particularly true for landlocked uh, countries, we often uh, discuss Central Europe, when we see all the developments around the hydrogen economy, uh, this is something we expect to, um, to be deployed first uh, in regions near to, um, to wind energy uh, sources, for example. So how do we make sure that um, indeed those, uh, those regions um, are, are not left uh, behind during the transition? This is particularly also relevant for, for the chemical sector. And therefore, it is very important to, to look uh, at the, the regional specificities of, uh, of, the, of the industry, uh, because there will be no one size fits all solution. I saw here, I'm afraid I also went beyond my time um, limits, but uh, um, yeah. thank you again for this. Thank you very much, Flori. And uh, so uh, we just move on to Frank Seaburn, um, uh, European Commission DG Employment. Uh, Frank, please, 10 minutes. Uh, Thank you, Bella. Hello, good afternoon. And um, apologies also for not being with you. I, I only managed this week to go to Stockholm, uh, not last week, like Jude, um, uh, in the context of a conference uh, commemorating the 50 years of the UN Conference on the Human Environment. And just to say that also in that context, at global level, there are a lot of discussions on just transition, uh, including uh, a new initiative uh, at the global level, also on uh, skills for youth. Um, and I, uh, we, I believe this is in general a, a topic which is of great relevance. It's a bit difficult to speak about, I do my best. Um, also, I, we have full understanding certainly for the, for the calls made for, for comprehensive frameworks, for, for planning policy certainty and for others. But I also have to admit that we look at these um, issues. We are not in charge, obviously not in the lead on all of these uh, topics. We look at uh, those topics from an angle of employment, social policy, in particular skill related issues. And I will focus on those and on the um, upcoming council recommendation uh, that Lute mentioned as well as um, uh, the recent uh, impacts, let's say, of the Repower EU plan and the, the related dimension there. Um, and uh, while it, let's say, uh, further action is certainly needed, the focus shifts on implementation, we agree on this. And also, um, uh, ambition levels could be raised in various dimensions. Uh, that's understood. I think it's also, uh, I took good note of what Matteo said on, on some member states, probably still lacking a, a clear strategy on the just transition that there's also a need or an added value of this step, we believe in um, bringing or matching better the, the climate ambition with the social ambition. Um, to start, as you know, and I think many of you are aware, um, we have taken up uh, a work in a new unit dealing with fair green digital transitions and research last year. And uh, we were tasked in the first Fit for 55 package of July last year to propose a council recommendation on ensuring a fair transition and uh, guiding member states in how to address labor and social impacts of climate and energy policies at large. Several of the proposals of Fit for 55, um, let's say, look at their specific impacts on the employment and social field and um, uh, propose related uh, actions, exempting households, uh, for example, from energy taxation through a transition or 
the proposal for a social climate fund, but there was also the understanding that, as uh, our speaker said before, the challenges are immense, that there are significant impacts uh, which have to be taken into account and which have to be dealt with as part of the transition. That's a narrative we fully share to make this transition um, a success. Um, we also believe that the scope of this recommendation is in line or has been aligned with the uh, recent developments, the new geopolitical developments, and also with a lot of the points discussed and presented in your very interesting study on how to decarbonize energy intensive industries and, um, let's say, uh, provide much more detailed evidence on the impacts on different decarbonization pathways, um, which was very interesting for us. So this study is uh, very timely and comes uh, uh, and certainly it's of great interest to us. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I probably don't have to go very <clears throat> far very back to say uh, what brought us here. That's obviously the Paris Agreement, the urgency to act uh, now more than ever, and, uh, and also to accelerate, uh, raise the, the ambition levels and accelerate the transition. And this is first and foremost because people expect us to do so. Um, people see a personal responsibility to contribute to fighting climate change. People see this as a major um, um, uh, threat to our livelihoods. And young people, when being asked well, how they see their, their career options, opportunities, or their, how they see themselves uh, in the future in the labor market, they make very clear that they expect to have uh, to contribute um, to fighting climate change. And some member states, more than 50%. So it's also a way to turn to attractiveness and uh, important for industry and all players, I think, to, to attract uh, skilled and engaged workers in the future. We also have seen accelerations needed because of the devastating effects, which are more and more frequent to extreme weather effects, as we've seen also in Central Europe last year. And last but not least, obviously, unfortunately, the new geopolitical situation following uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine, which does call for further acceleration of our policies, and which also finds um, the support in large parts of the population to do so, even if this is a major challenge. All of this was stated very clearly in the IPCC reports earlier this year, which have made clear that without determined action, uh, stopping global warming to go beyond 1.5 degrees is beyond reach. And I think given this, um, we believe that the Green Deal and the Green Transition is a necessary agenda also for industry, not one against industry at all. Um, and one which also can help to adjust to other uh, trends, which was said, which would also include, include um, a change in consumption, lifestyle, mobility patterns in the, in the future. Uh, one word on Repower EU and the geopolitical situation. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which just took place a few days after the IPCC report was published, has unified Europe, we believe, in the understanding that the green transition is now needed more than ever, uh, also to include um, safeguard Europe's energy security and the independency from fossil fuel imports, uh, as said before. This also means that the focus on just transition now is needed more than ever and probably uh, very effective tools uh, and uh, actions to put these into practice, as is the design and concrete implementation, as was mentioned, of concrete decarbonization pathways and just transition strategies. So here again, I think uh, your input is, is really uh, timely and what is needed. We do not deny that all of this is a key challenge for economy and society at large and for industry in particular. Uh, um, as uh, these changes, uh, faster transition, uh, phasing out much faster, uh, renewable energy production, uh, changing permitting procedures, uh, shift to new uh, alternative uh, forms of uh, um, um, uh, sustainable fossil uh, fuels, etc., obviously do bring with them many, many challenges as regards production, industrial value chains, uh, and many of the others. These issues have been addressed in the Commission's communication earlier in March on the Repower EU plan, which highlighted that uh, at the time of the start of the war, the EU imported 90% of its gas consumption from Russia. Um, uh, sorry, in, no, unfortunately not. I imported 90% of its gas consumption from abroad, obviously, of which Russia provided 40%, uh, in addition, 27% of oil imports and 46% of coal imports. Um, the Commission has issued, uh, following the mandate by the heads of state, a comprehensive Repower EU package mid-May, 
which tries to respond to these challenges and which lays out strategies to accelerate the green transition, diversify our sources, save energy, and accelerate the transition to renewable energy production. Um, in this context, the Commission, uh, the communication acknowledges that an acceleration of the clean energy transition will require effective employment skills and social policies in line with the European Pillar of Social Rights. It highlighted in particular or encouraged um, or stated in particular the Commission will encourage stakeholders um, in renewable energy production, solar uh, energy in particular, but also others, and uh, speed up uh, permitting processes, and will support those by establishing a large-scale skills partnership under the Pact for Skills for onshore renewables. It also stated that the Commission will support skills through Erasmus Plus and to the joint undertaking on clean hydrogen with the launch of a large project to develop skills for the hydrogen economy. And the package also did not deny that there are other challenges regarding risks of energy poverty um, and uh, interestingly also on uh, risks uh, coming with a uh, high as well as proposals for possible other additional market interventions. Um, and okay. At the time, uh, which, which uh, and later in March, where the Commission listed what member states can do in terms of emergency measures to help uh, households and companies. Uh, and in the March communication in particular, it also uh, highlighted the put, uh, or at least alluded to possibilities of price caps and, and or taxing windfall profits um, as one way to deal uh, with this and address um, the particular challenges. Um, Obviously, the energy, the intensive industries are a sector with particular challenges in this area. I do not have to tell you, and you will have discussed what the potential job uh, um, impacts are. There are also a lot of opportunities, as we know, in new sectors, the circular economy, uh, and in other sectors, construction, uh, renewable energy production, and others, as well as in energy intensive industries, automotive value chains, and others through restructuring and transformations themselves. Uh, we acknowledge that those effects, job creation opportunities and uh, losses uh, and restructuring needs um, um, differ across uh, not only sectors and ecosystems, but also across regions. And that those of the regional effects have to be taken into account and that there are two specific strategies have to be put in place which address specific needs of member states of sectors and of regions. Um, Based on such evidence, uh, and that's what our recommendation, our work tried to argue, is that with the right accompanying policies in place, however, the transition can bring a triple dividend, reduce emissions, create good quality jobs, and um, uh, increase welfare and health and well being of people overall. I will not have time to go into detail. Many of you probably know, and you already heard um, a critical review um, of our recommendation just to say that the recommendation does highlight the need that member states put in place comprehensive policy packages which do respond to the specific needs as i just mentioned and which do cover access to quality employment access to quality uh, education training lifelong learning on the job but also uh, sufficient support uh, to households um, and the workers uh, in the transition through temporary income support and social effective social protection. And last but not least, uh, investments in improvements of uh, essential services and infrastructures, alternative infrastructures, also in energy and transport. Um, in addition to that, uh, the recommendation does relate to enabling conditions, and this covers, uh, again, in re uh, relation to, as I understand the study and uh, your discussions today, the need to strengthen the evidence base. Yes, we, we it's good to have long-term projections of, uh, let's say, outcomes in case everything goes as planned in, as regards policy implementation and uh, also provision of uh, skills, for example, and the raw materials and other factors 
uh, which are important here. But we also need to improve our evidence base uh, to, uh, to have a better view of what are um, actual impacts, granular impacts on the ground in sectors concerned and regions concerned so that we can steer these transition pathways and adjust policies and uh, mm -hmm. review probably pathways as needed. This is also needed for discussion and for involvement of all stakeholders, including social partners, obviously, uh, and uh, civil society actors at large, because uh, we believe that in full involvement of the stakeholders uh, in the transition uh, uh, is essential. There's no transition possible without even more so given the time pressure now, and given the fact that this is a transition which we cannot reiterate uh, in a few decades uh, ahead. And last but not least, also we have to respond to, I think what Jude was uh, alluding to, um, uh, threats or risks or fears related to transitions, uh, relating also to experiences of previous uh, uh, recovery periods or restructuring periods where outcomes may not have been as hoped for or where recovery, like after the financial crisis, was not as inclusive as, as we had hoped for. Um, I will finish by saying that um, the impact assessments underlying the work of the Commission already have looked at mixed scenarios to some extent, often looking at price signals uh, or uh, on the one hand and regulatory measures on the other. But uh, your idea is to go to much more uh, granular and detailed transition pathways and sector specific transition pathways is certainly one which is um, uh, interesting. And just to say that there's a lot of uh, uh, follow up work coming, not only follow up actions as uh, foreseen in our recommendation to put this into concretely into, into action the, the, together with member states, but also there's in particular review of the European climate the intermediate target, climate target, uh, foreseen uh, in the review of the European yeah. uh, forward-looking transition pathways. Uh, no, we don't uh, really policies. hear you, but... Hello? Yeah, well, it's interrupting all the time. Uh, unfortunately. Okay, sorry. No? Okay, so I will I will then finalize with, by saying that uh, joining in the conclusions of the study that this kind of um, more granular evidence and uh, increased focus on uh, employment effects and social effects of uh, more um, realistic scenarios, which unfortunately also have to include more extreme scenarios these days, is certainly something on the agenda. The recommendation also looks at funding. I will not speak about this and just uh, finalize uh, by, by repeating again what I said that we believe this is an agenda also for industry to safeguard competitiveness and jobs in industry and to put policies in place which can help workers and industries to do this. We take note of what's still missing and what could be done uh, once this recommendation is adopted in two weeks time, we hope, and uh, obviously involvement of social partners in projects and implementation is key and we look forward to cooperating with you on this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, so uh, actually, we are a little bit um, over. So the planned uh, uh, time schedule for this uh, first round. So we don't really have much time for a second, but uh, but still, of course, we want to have that. So um, uh, questions uh, uh, from the uh, audience here. Um, if there are any, yes, there is one. Oh, yeah. yes, please. Uh, Should I need to use my phone? Yeah, you will get one. Yeah. Hmm? I my question mm -hmm. is yeah, quite direct and concrete. I hope. I mean, yeah. I would like to hear so concrete please. answers. Yeah. Uh, I, I after reading several documents of industrial documents about uh, transition and pre preparedness for the for the process. And hearing now uh, Brussels, uh, what, what the Brussels says, both the uh, Commission and the organizations in Brussels, I see a large discrepancy between what is uh, what understand the business in 
my country and what is said how how for instance industrial translates the the, the um, what is happening in in the commission and and, other, and parliament so so my question is what would you recommend what are the concrete uh, and 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 this uh, here i refer um, more specifically to the preparedness of labor force and drive toward preparing uh, uh, workers to the shift or that will be necessary under the new technological uh, shift. So, so my question is, what would you think are the best, most efficient instruments that could drive both trade unions and industries to prepare the workers to the transition that we are we will be facing? Mm -hmm. uh, more concrete, more more needed, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh I see, yes, uh, I think it's okay. One more, uh, Slavica, please. Um, yeah, uh, Slavica Uzelats, um, European Federation of uh, Building and uh, Woodworkers. I would like, uh, since they like very much what Judith was saying, and <clears throat> of course, I, I, I will repeat and uh, support this that um, this transition, transition of probably rather transformation, needs to be done with social partners together. And uh, I would like to remind here also the colleague from the Commission that for the second half of this year, there is a plan to put forward a council recomm recommendation on um, strengthening national social dialogue. So voila, again, another opportunity for the Commission to put forward a strong document. Um, and we unions, I think what we also put forward as a demand in this recommendation is that social partners are better and are stronger involved in the European semester. So this is in some countries not happening at all. So voila, here another opportunity for the Commission to, to, uh, yeah, to put forward uh, concrete uh, and strong initiatives. Yeah. I think with these two questions, uh, we have enough uh, material for this uh, closing round. I don't need to add anything, and Judith has to leave in a few minutes. So uh, Judith will reflect first, and then uh, then um, uh, I pass to her. Yeah, um, no, thank you very much for the question. Um, and uh, you'll appreciate that in uh, a very short amount, of time, I tried to stick to 10 minutes. I did, obviously didn't manage it, but in a very short amount of time and, pre and presenting, um, uh, the kind of overall view, I didn't go into too much detail on uh, the different um, demands that we're making, but within the uh, manifesto, we have five uh, chapters and um, those chapters relate to how we see a policy, a just transition framework building to prepare um, the workforce, but to prepare the workforce in a way that the workforce are involved in the preparation right from the start. So on the one hand, you need to have um, a national industrial policy. We heard that very clearly from, um, from uh, Italy, but we've heard it from many other countries as well. You need to have that framework of a strategy of where we're going to at sectoral level. Uh, we heard that clearly also from the UK. If you only take a regional dimension, you miss out the sectoral uh, level. That's, that's not uh, possible. Equally, you need to um, have uh, a, that local um, that local view of what's possible in different um, regions. And there in Poland, for example, we've worked very closely with our Polish affiliates um, over the last few years in, um, in a variety of ways. So in very concrete ways, like in the development of the uh, just transition plan for Eastern Wielkopolska uh, would be a very concrete example of um, the transition in, from a, in a coal region where, okay, it's a smaller coal workforce than say um, other parts of Silesia, but um, a, a transition plan, which I know that Instrat were also involved in. So, and uh, I recognize uh, that you're part of the game there, um, but a very pragmatic agenda of how you, conv how you build a proactive trade union view on the transformation of um, a workforce and, uh, and workplaces towards a, a future strategy. 
So that would be a very concrete, a good case example from our perspective of how you pull together skills policies, industrial strategy, worker involvement and anticipation, the right of people uh, to collectively bargain and uh, to negotiate the job to job transitions. We still have to see um, that will be that will need an evaluation if this really delivers real job to job transitions, because some of our analysis is quite open in terms of whether the number of coal miners and coal sector workers, for example, moving into the wind industry, it's very questionable whether this is really delivering um, a transition. But equally, we're talking with um, uh, the miners in um, in other parts of Poland about um, minor to minor transitions, if you like. Uh, so the needs in terms of critical raw materials mean that the Polish copper mines and silver mines become all the more important in terms of um, supply chains. What potential is there for the transfer of active working miners from one mining sector, which we're trying to phase down to another minor se mining sector, which we know we need in the long term? These are uh, all part of of the the framework that we're that we're kind of working with. Obviously, the demands at European level for the for the overarching framework are to create the opportunities and the levers for workers at the local level who know better what their the opportunities are for their region, for their industry, for for their workplace. Uh, the problem that we have is that um, in many parts of of Europe workers aren't anywhere near the table, even when just transition is the term that's in the mix. Um, that's interpreted in a way which means that just transition is talked about in the room. Um, our concept from the trade union movement has made it onto the, the political table, but the workforce is still outside the room um, looking in. And the, the, what we're trying to do from the European level is create an enabling framework for just transition, which then allows workers at the various levels to be um, at the table. That's essentially our objective, but obviously it gets very concrete. Um, we're not, you can't stay at very generic uh, policy demands uh, when you're going down to the, the regional, the local level, or when you're talking the sectoral dimension, but, um, but it's difficult in the context of a panel like this to, to give those very pre precise um, uh, dimensions. And I would say that, also, uh, one of the key uh, things that we have been doing, which we don't publicize um, for understandable reasons, is that we also have played a role in creating back channels for um, workers to be able to get information directly from European policymakers in particular, um, particularly where we see that governments um, sometimes uh, present Brussels as the place that is imposing uh, something and imposing something which is actually a decision in the capital. Um, and that's also a source of, of uh, frustration for unions who then don't feel like they have all of the um, all of the information to be able to really engage in the politics and the political decisions which are going on. So part of our role is not, we don't publicize, but it's about creating back channels so that um, those conversations can be had. And that is particularly important in the context of coal phase outs and um, the discussions around uh, the exit of coal from um, some particularly, uh, some very large Central Eastern European countries. Yeah, very important. Thanks a lot. Uh, really. Uh, so uh, I apologize. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, sure. We are actually, uh, anyway, coming to an end. Uh, so, I mean, uh, just uh, I pass the word to, to Flori first and then to Frank. Um, to, uh, sorry? Yes, okay, so then Frank, uh, you are the one. Uh, uh, I, I would only add, uh, you know, what, what, what Judith was <laughs> emphasizing also, but what uh, came out also of the questions that there is, uh, well, uh, we have an extremely uh, conflictual and turbulent process due to yes. all the external factors and also uh -huh. due to the pressure of uh, the climate emergency. So these are critical years. Uh, and, and critical also in the sense that, that the legislative package is getting uh, in a ripe phase. So the critical elements of the, the Fit for 55 uh, uh, package are, are in a decisive phase. So this is all very good. Uh, 
Uh, but this all means that a lot of uh, action is coming to the member state level. And the member states uh, have to prepare and they do prepare all the plans from the recovery plans to the energy uh, and climate plans to the dust transition plans and everything. Uh, but member states are extremely differentially prepared. We have a huge variety and we see the gap uh, well in many ways in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, this is creating new inequalities uh, to cope with these ch challenges. So, I mean, there is also uh, a big challenge how to facilitate this process and how member states can become more ready uh, at industrial policy and, of course, uh, uh, industrial relations. No, well, it was just adding to the. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. no, that, that's uh, thanks, Bella. That's um, that's challenging indeed, uh, and obviously the the particular situation of member states have to be taken into account, and they have to sort of design a pathway uh, which is in line with the, with the commitments taken, so that that we all um, coordinate our action and meet our climate uh, targets. Uh, initially, the RF was set up to avoid exactly this, to avoid the this crisis, which the unheard crisis of at the time, which was the pandemic. Creates divergence and um, let's say uh, un, um, leads to to long-lasting negative adverse effects uh, for the union overall, and this should not be different now in the sense that um, let's say packages and uh, uh, funding instruments are also used for the green transition. Uh, that's for sure. I don't have a quick answer how to do it, and I'm not um, uh, familiar with all aspects of it, but. Uh, I think that point is taken has to be uh, taken into account. Maybe on the two questions addressed, I will um, I start with the first one because it also relates to the RIF. I take good note of the expectations regarding the council recommendation on strengthening social dialogue. Uh, point taken. Um, what we have done, for example, the Repower EU package, which you know foresees that each member state has to submit a new Repower EU chapter under their national uh, recovery and resilience plans, that their uh, social partners obviously should be involved um, closely in the design and implementation of that chapter. And uh, you have seen uh, communications from the Commission to what extent this has been the case or not before in that context, on the context of the European semester. So we are aware that this, these processes can be approved in parts. And uh, we believe that in, with the, in the Repower EU package, this was strengthened. On the other question, what's in the concrete and um, what should the member states be doing? Yes, I would like to highlight, and the, the same point was made by, by Jude, um, this recommendation with the Commission made a proposal, it was negotiated um, for almost half a year in council. So the final text will be one with which uh, member states do agree. And uh, so member states do in generally sup did support and do support this approach to just transition. And they also have made, uh, uh, let's say, uh, proactive proposals on areas which they see important. Um, this is not to say that uh, our recommendation, what we can do at that level, um, uh, can be prescriptive to the point that we are telling member states what they should be doing. That's why the, uh, it's a soft uh, re tool as a recommendation, which was rather broad, because obviously the actions have to be geared to the national uh, circumstances. However, we have an accompanying analytical paper, a staff working document, where we do list some good practices, uh, which I think uh, could be show some concrete examples, for example, on revenue recycling, how to repay a part of additional energy uh, taxation, for example, carbon, uh, carbon pricing uh, revenues to vulnerable households to also ensure uh, to avoid regressive effects. So we do analyses which help design such policies and avoid that and engage with member states. And other concrete measures, which I mentioned, obviously, are in re with regard to preparedness, uh, help member states and uh, Europe at large to better anticipate skill needs. Um, uh, this is modeling work, but also work uh, with uh, as stakeholder social partners. Um, Jude mentioned job to job transitions. That's one angle. So we do believe that uh, key of success will be in designing adequate job to job transitions with fit to the, the case of the sector, the case of the region. There are some good examples out there. Others can be developed. Um, and this includes also uh, income support, for example, or training support or combined support to the workers concerned. And I think 
there are collective there are also examples of co collectively bargained solutions how to accompany such support or ideas of policy measures at national level level how to support uh, workers throughout the training so while training for a new job in the green economy they still should um, uh, let's say uh, uh, be be uh, be uh, benefit from from this social protection we also need to showcase benefits as i said examples of where there are positive benefits and opportunities which were made and where we did manage to to um, to accompany transitions towards quality jobs poland is one of the examples mentioned which is a country with an upgrading labor market where a lot of the um, jobs concerned uh, which will have to be phased out are currently among the most uh, high paying jobs so obviously the transitions there also have to take into account how to how to maintain this quality element in the transition and design quality jobs uh, well paying jobs safe jobs in the in the green economy or in other parts other parts of the economy included in the transition um and um i think i leave it at these few examples of concrete actions there's also as i said the list of action proposals what the commission is planning to do and i'm happy to engage with uh, the audience of people who have um, uh, contacts uh, my colleague Thais consults in the room so please feel free to reach out to us and tell us what concrete actions are missing and how to work together on this um, last point maybe we have also an open call for proposals open until early august on the social innovations for fair green transitions uh, so we do look also for um, interesting uh, uh, associations social partners firms training institutions communities who want to design or test new ways of social innovations uh, which which can let's say strengthen this fairness dimension so if there are ideas or, or need we are we're more than happy to consider applications as well. I leave it there, but I'm more than happy to continue that discussion when back in Brussels or elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, we came to the end and thank you all the participants. Uh, but I would like to say that uh, uh, the results of this uh, uh, research project will be published uh, well, uh, step by step. Uh, so. Uh, the next uh, step will be that uh, we will publish a working paper, a modeling uh, exercise on the effects of the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the CBAM, um, just linked uh, to uh, actual uh, political debates. Uh, then uh, then uh, the country uh, studies uh, will follow uh, in an edited form. So this is all coming. Uh, this is everything for the public uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, then uh, we will also made available the presentations of this uh, uh, event uh, after uh, asked, uh, having asked the authors, and uh, this will be also available on the website. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Frank, and uh, all the best. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.